My next guest is Kylie Young, the managing partner of 500 Global, the venture capital firm which has invested in a whole bunch of businesses in the region, including seven unicorns such as Grab, Carousel, Bukalapa, and Carsom. Prior to his career as a venture capitalist, Kylie was an entrepreneur, having started and exited successfully two firms, a Group Small and Sales.com. Now, having generously spent the better part of half a day with me recording this interview and showing me around his new office around Sasana Kijang, I found Kylie to be a really fascinating character because not only is he an entrepreneur, and venture capitalist, he is also a philosopher, having reached certain interesting, fascinating conclusions about people, the world, and life in general. If, like me, you found this conversation to be interesting and fascinating and useful, please do tell me what you think in the comments below, share it around with your friends, give me a like as well, and as always, it's a huge help if you can subscribe to the channel. Without further ado, dear viewers, may I now present Kylie Young. Hey Kylie Young, man, thank you for doing this. I've known of you for a long time, obviously, um, and I'm quite glad that you finally agreed to do this. Um, maybe we can start with um, with the content world. I think that's where you really made your mark initially, and that's where you made your pot, essentially, right? Um, because of the proliferation of platforms today, and because there's so many... I mean, the whole world of media is changing ever so much, right? I just wanted to get your point of view in terms of where you, where, how you interpret the media world now. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, thanks for uh, I, uh, finally inviting me to the show as well. You know, it's like, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, it's good to be here. Uh, I think a lot of my friends and other folks who I admire yeah. and respect very much, right, have yeah. like spoken at length about some really interesting things. So I think that if you're uh, curious about media, I, I have a lot of uh, tension and conflict when it comes to media, uh, but a lot of love for it. Yeah. I think in my... Uh, I think that when I was 15 years old, when I first um, started to teach myself how to code and build websites, then you start to look at your visitor count. You're like, oh, someone from Poland visited my website. Yep. Right? You get really excited. And I think a lot of that is like the love of communicating. There's a lot of information that gets exchanged. Now, when I built says.com, a lot of Malaysians didn't know that at one point it had even more traffic than Malaysia Kini at the start. Right? But people are like, who says.com, right? Because a lot of the folks who are observing media or buying media, I think they were... Um, they they didn't see that Malaysia was actually largely youth, you know, age 35 and under uh, mobile consumption. And that's really where Sys.com won. But one of the goals I had when building that media company, the original goals of it, is that I felt that a functioning democracy couldn't work if citizens were not informed. And I thought that if we have a way to kind of translate nourishing, interesting, um, um, uh, useful information in a way that a social media generation can consume, then that would actually be like a positive thing. However, what we later realized was that a lot of the most uh, nourishing content, or at least if we put a moral lens to it, like things which are like valuable content, they had the least views. And then like things were junky, more dramatic, you know, more entertainment and lifestyle centric, like that tend to have more views. But I'm not saying that in an absolute sense because like we had a lot of times where we had the sweet spot where we actually come up with stuff which is pretty insightful and then it's really viral and gets like millions of views as well, right? But I think to your question about like uh, media, now uh, when I sold uh, says.com eventually to Media Prima, I mean, we listed it uh, via uh, a reverse merger of Catcher Media Berhad first on the Bursa, right? Then later we sold it to Media Prima. It was about 105 million ringgit uh, at the time. Like what it was was that... Um, Content and media at the time, we saw that Facebook, uh, Google, and other large social media platforms, by and large, their algorithms and their news feeds were the ones that were starting to dictate where things are going, right? And they were also taking a lot more ad dollars. So hence, like a lot of the other uh, um, uh, journalists, content producers, right? We, we have to start pandering to the algorithm. And I feel like power, I, I feel like that was actually a very, very good time to kind of transition things out, right? Yeah, I want to talk, talk about um, a phrase that you brought up in our offline call to prepare for this interview. And I think you used the phrase uh, cerebral integrity, right? Yeah. And the problem is people don't want to have necessarily um, positive and constructive discussions. They want to be in a way, and this is what I found from the traffic flows, right? They want to be in a way, um, you know, they want to be um, to read controversial stuff or uh, things which make them angry or um, to make them fearful, right? And that's the problem because the content which makes which should make you it's like it's like as you say right um people who who should be healthy and eat vegan food um they're in the minority but the junk food junkies and and the fried food so many people that are and everything right um that's the problem we have well in, in some small way me but in a much bigger way you right how do you build a country um when when the traffic flow is not necessarily in that mind state of mind Oh no, that's a, okay. The, the, that's that's uh, building a country. Okay, we yeah. take that kind of perspective of building a country. Let, let me flip it the other way around. Let's talk about how do you enslave a country, 
Yeah, exactly. Okay? exactly let's talk about that, yeah. right? Because if I wanted to enslave your country, yeah. what I would do is I would to make sure that like uh, it is it is um, that your citizens are constantly eating crap so that your citizens will get obese very quickly and then your healthcare costs especially if you're if they can't afford it like somehow someone's got to pay for it yeah. right either with citizen unrest or, or public health bills right so your PL as a country will be really damaged because your citizens are are just very very unhealthy okay, it's the first thing i might do right secondly is that i'm going to deliberate their capacity for independent entrepreneurial thinking right so they become a nation of consumers they become a nation that's enslaved to consumption, right? Thirdly, is that I'm going to influence them to buy a ton of random crap that's not produced in the country and has not much circular economy and overflows back into the country, right? So if I were to really want to hurt your country, like I can just make them unhealthy, I can, uh, <laughs> you know, to feed them a lot of rubbish things to think about, right? And 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 just poke the parts of the brain which is just dramatic. And, and, and unnecessary. And then the third one is that like I can encourage them to actually buy a lot of random crap that is from elsewhere and spend their money everywhere else, right? So then your local economy will just start shrinking because you have a nation of consumers and not a nation of creators. You know, you have a you you actually imprison your people, right? So then we talk about media. Okay. So let's say I don't want to I don't want to totally destroy your country with these modern means, right? And what I want to do is that actually I want to enrich your country. What are we gonna do, right? So my job today as a venture capitalist is right? <laughs> quite uh like uh, it, you know, we 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 have a role to play because we're actually investing and funding um, things which are um, which we we we're choosing which entrepreneurs and build what type of companies. And one of our larger themes is that of rural rural digitization. Okay, picture this. I zoom out a little. We have um, right now about three and a half billion, almost four billion, internet users in the world. There's another about three to four billion that's going to come online soon. These folks are mostly in rural areas. Because the folks in the city, for the, by and large, like have two or three smartphones, right? And exaggerating here, but you know what I mean? Like this is well covered, right? So if you're going to give smartphones and access to another three to four billion people, what is the first few like dopamine hits they're going to get? Is the first app download going to be TikTok? Probably. Right? Okay. Probably, then, right? Yeah. Second is that, and then like what, when what, they get e-commerce so they can buy stuff. I was talking to one of our founders the other day, right? They... They do logistics and commerce and distribution to tier four, tier five cities in Indonesia. It, it's highly valuable. They're funded by developmental, uh, what's that, funding uh, agencies around the world. And it's, it's real humanitarian work. Uh, but it's also very profitable because you're bringing goods and services to people who traditionally had less of it. But I asked him, I said, hey, do you feel like after a while they're just going to buy a lot of useless crap? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, they will. You know, they, they they probably will, like us, right? We're buying a ton of useless crap too. But I'm like, hey, you know what? But I mean, I'm, I'm not going to start like the anti-consumerist about this conversation, but I, I personally have no agenda against useless crap. But basically what I'm trying to say is that like, um, I think that like if we if we can play a part to invest in, to guide or entrepreneurs or people to build or fund things that like you can package, for example, educational content alongside some of those. Yeah. You know, we're very early backers of Grab, right? And yeah. they had a lot of experiments where they're trying yeah. to send nourishing content into the, the cell phones of the, the smartphones of the Grab drivers, for example, right? So these are things that like sometimes I think we, we have to think about it. Well, it's a big problem because in the new small where I come from, right, there's a phrase that says, um, nothing sells news like bad news, right? And you yeah. can see it extrapolated in a huge way to the, to the mass medium. And uh, th that's, that's a real problem because at the end of the day, like um, some fund managers will say, right, everybody in Southeast Asia, you have 700, 700 million people here, of which there's uh, many of them in the lower middle classes and B40s, right? Yeah. All of them want... Um, all of them want high blood pressure, right? Yeah. KFC and McDonald's. Yeah. All of them want to be stressed out. They want to have jobs in the city. All of them want to chase that consumerism, right? Which they can't afford most yeah. of the time. And they drive themselves deep into the debt cycle. Yeah. That, that's a big problem, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a death spiral to the bottom. So yeah. for, for people like me, right? And, and so for people like in, in the mass media, we want to play the game where I talk to someone like you and I can spread positivity and constructivism into the world. But that only garners 1,000, 2,000 views. What will get me 100,000 views or a million views is political um, vitriol. Um, you criticizing the politics and the corruption and we bitch about it and then it gets mm. a million views, right? Mm. That's a big problem. But it seems to me that humans are killing themselves because they're shooting themselves in the foot. Okay, let's play with this a little bit. There's yeah, quite, okay. like, quite a few things to unpack over here. Um, so the first thing is that, like, let's say we work with your thesis for a moment, and we say that. So you disagree? Uh, no, I want to play with it, right? Okay. okay so let's say let's say we we uh, we work with your thesis for a moment, and say that um, 
anything that gets people quite angry and 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 bitchy or whatever that will that will get more views yeah let's just take that one nugget you you mentioned a lot of important things ever that's one nugget right the way i see it says media and what is effective in media and this is true like four good years of millions of posts all analyzed and done through says.com changing headlines body of content split testing the data right my theory is this what sells isn't specifically just of course like things which you know you have to actually elevate someone's emotional state above the emotional state they're in so if they are kind of like peaceful and chill and you get them a bit pissed off okay then you got the energy in your body to want to hit the share button or send yeah. it to a friend or yeah. whatsapp it to somebody you know or at least comment or rant or become a troll okay that's if you elevate that but that's not that's not only one means of elevating it so for me is that like what can we put out into the world if you're taking a media lens what can we put out in the world that takes their emotion up a notch lower a notch help them find peace and calm and you see a lot of like youtube uh videos for example is like calming scenery 123 million views right do you know what i mean right. so because you see so so that goes against what my theory is right it, oh, i builds it out it builds it out your, your theory is correct it's yeah. correct everything you said is correct because you you take someone's emotional state and bring them to a state of like pissed off okay you get you you you're going to get something you can elicit a response right but you can take it to an inspired state as well so in in uh my wife and i in our philanthropic work we uh we like to venture build we like to build companies in our in our philanthropic work so one of the companies we built how uh, we funded and then like kind of like co co-founded and and built with a team and 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 funded was uh uh is uh my forever doggo okay so this is a dog uh it, it's a media company for targeted the theme of dogs okay <laughs> so, so yeah you check out our instagram we have my forever doggo and it's all my wife's work i'm not i'm not going to take any credit for it you know like i i think she she's done like an amazing job with that with the team what what it is with the uh my forever doggo is that um dogs are sometimes uh treated in a very ill way in malaysia relative to a lot of other countries right there's a lot of unnecessary hatred towards dogs with reasons that we don't need to get into but the content on the topic of content is that it's easy to get a lot of views if you show abuse cases of dogs right correct okay we talk, oh look at this dog walking out whatever and you show a dead dog over there right? okay then you know you, you know and then trigger warning okay yeah, yeah, then yeah. you're gonna you get some views right yeah, yeah. But then it's like she says no. Like yeah. she's got the same tenet as you. I said yeah. no. This is not what it's about, right? Correct. Like we're trying to encourage kindness. We're just not trying to like encourage more hate. Yeah. So what does the world need more now? Like you need yeah. more stories of hate or more stories of hope, right? Hope. Hope. Sure. Exactly, yeah. right? So so she says, okay, let's test this. Let's build some content. Oh, this kind then the kind abang, you know, stops the car, gets out of the car. Just the, the dog is trapped under the wheel of uh, whatever. Then he like do 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 two three hours and later the abang's like TikTok is blown up because it's so sweet, right? It's like it really moves you. Right? Then you talk about uh the recently with the uh Medica uh parade. Yeah. There's so many dogs, like they're the K9 force or whatever. So they did a a, a, a TikTok uh, no tic- yeah, a TikTok and also like Instagram thing on that. Was a hundred over thousand shares, bro. So so hence like I want to build out your theory that okay. it's not just pain that yeah. and, and, and anger that elicits views. There's actually different modalities. Now us is like let's say for example if you wear because I'm no longer a media person, correct, guys, correct. so I'll put that as a media care to everyone over here on this podcast, right? I'm a venture capitalist. <laughs> I fund startups, okay? Like I'm not sales.com is the ten years ago I was doing that, right? It's still in me, but what I want to say is that we have to discover and to and build more skill with using the feed using the algorithms and and pushing those algorithms to to parlay nourishing content okay i'm going to put back something else you said mm. which is about food right some can argue like oh you know like oh if you if you like maybe you're like b40 you eat a lot of kfc i think i think that's very simplistic and i think that's uh, accurate in some ways but very inaccurate in other ways as well what i would say is that if you look at elon musk's brother uh kimball right i think he was trying to do a food project and the other entrepreneurs are trying to do a food project as well where they're just saying look if you can make healthier food tasty enough but most importantly cheap enough then you can really get it to the masses because one of the criticisms against healthier food and vegan food or any other kind of food it is organic or what not is so atas man like yeah. it's some t20 yeah. yeah. uh, bull crap right yeah. like it's just so expensive i'm not going to pay have you seen some of these like broccolis right yeah, yeah, have you yeah, shop yeah. for broccoli yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like you got tw- tw- 29 ringgit this piece of broccoli i'm staring at this broccoli i'm I've, it's it's offensive really yeah, i mean, I mean why? beyond meat burgers are like 50 bucks forget it yeah forget exactly it. Yeah. beyond so yeah so and so i i think that like the the entrepreneurs investors and the kind of like the business community if they get the job right of bringing the unit cost down because that's what mcdonald's and kfc managed to do yeah what 699 you get a sort of correct. a meal correct <laughs> 
Yeah, you, you sort of get a meal. Zero ca- well, zero nutrition value, but still. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And then yeah. you look at nasi lemak, right? Because what's making, like, I, I guess for, if you want to, again, destroy a country or whatever, yeah, there are a lot of cultural foods, you name it, right? Yeah. But there was this comparison quite many years ago because everyone's saying that, oh, Big Mac give you a heart attack or whatever. And then, like, re- McDonald's response, you know, front page of Star, I remember I was quite young at the time, just comparing the nutritional content of nasi lemak versus Big Mac. Yeah. Big Mac won. Like, really? Yeah, apparently so. I mean, depending on what sambal, how much sambal you, you use, lah, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, there's a weight. I mean, like, uh, the point being is that, like, the larger picture of nutritious versus non nutritious, entrepreneurs and investors have to apply skill. If you want to, like, be a, like a warrior of light, okay, and, like, use the, the laws, the physics of capitalism in a way that y- y- you, you're, you, is good, yeah. you just need to learn a new skill. Because the skills of like using like like making money in like not so cool ways that make people fat and, and ill and dumb yeah. and stupid or whatever yeah. it is, or buy dumb use of shit, that is available to us. It's correct. known to us. Correct, correct. But there is a world that we've not discovered yet and a lot of our entrepreneurs in our portfolio, they are discovering that. And that you can make a lot of money doing a lot of good. Correct. And I got a ton of stories for you. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay, hold that thought, right? So, among all the shit that is going through in this world today, right? Um, people like to fill their minds with either very negative stuff or there's some other people that some of caught who want to fill their, stu- their minds with positive constructive, stru- constructive stuff, right? Now, the thing is, the world I come from is, is the broadcast media, right? mass media world, right? But what is really happening today in the content creating world is it's become very individualistic. People like Mr. Beast, I think he's offered a billion bucks to, to cash out and to sell. He didn't want to sell because... I mean, obviously, obviously the money he makes is on auto yeah. higher than that right then you got people like Ali Abdal so these people they, they're on an individual basis they're really changing the world but they're doing it on an individual way so I want to get your into okay. your mind right in terms of um, the money that you raise the VCs that you're doing the thinking process how you evaluate businesses right um, how 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 are you looking at Southeast Asia as a region in terms of where to allocate your capital and where the next move is? Because people like you look into the future when you allocate your capital. You don't look into the past or the Absolutely. present, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Like I've, I've been like making bets on the future for now 10 years. Right. Like, so uh, two months ago, like, I clocked in 10 years as a venture capitalist, right? Yeah. So you're right, right? The job of a VC and my job, essentially, especially because we've got seed stage vehicles as our platform, we're investing in ideas. We're investing yeah. in early stage. You yeah. just have like two or three team members and yeah. a basic product, right? So we're investing in a 10, 20, 30 year horizon. But of course, we want to monetize by 10 years, but we're investing in the future. So there are two hats. I'll give you two dimensions to this. So the first dimension, as like a, a, a co-owner of 500 Global as a platform, we managed now, I mean, since it's a bit of a Malaysian audience, it's close to about 14 billion ringgit, right? Yesterday, we just closed another round of uh, uh, funding for some of our funds dedicated for Southeast Asia. Um, so that's about 667 million ringgit. So the, and we're supported, I mean, the, the people who participated at EPF, Co-op, Kazana, right? All these folks like into, into to back venture capital. Um, it, it's a myth that Malaysian institutions are not, like involved in the venture capital, they are, and these are all returning investors, right? Yeah. So, so I'll say that they actually are supporting. But what I'll say about this job is that the first one is just globally. What are we? What is Five Hundred Global trying to do, as part of this larger, you know, issue that you brought up? We've invested now in three thousand, three thousand companies in eighty countries, out of which um, uh, forty plus companies have emerged to be worth more than a billion dollars or more. Some of them like ten, twenty, thirty billion dollars. About 180 of them are worth more than 100 million US dollars and hopefully they'll become worth a billion dollars someday. Now, what's more important is none of these companies are in China. I'm not saying because I have anything against China. In fact, I freaking love China. I wish we did more in China. But it's that it's just that the history of where it began was Silicon Valley. So half of the portfolio is in Silicon Valley. The other half is, you can call it rest of the world. And I, I want to talk about this. We've got Latin America, Middle East, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, we have 340 companies. Malaysia, we've got 80 companies over here, right? So... We believe there's opportunity outside of Silicon Valley. And that was the original thesis, is that if we can bring the entrepreneurial spirit, but most importantly, the entrepreneurial know-how on top of the capital to more places in the world, then people like you and I, we can build things and we can change our fates, right? Then our local stock markets would be more functional because we get a lot of new blood and new companies getting into the local stock exchanges, right? It has to start somewhere. And then if you're only backing things which are loanable, that banks will loan to, you actually have a very slow growth curve. In fact, in, in Malaysia, right. for example, you can't even get a corporate credit card unless you've got two years of history, Correct. right? Correct. And then like, you can't even get back loans unless XYZ cash flows and so forth, right? So if, if, if debt is the only vehicle for economic growth, like you're screwed, yeah. right? You're not going to have this leapfrog. You need venture capital. So hence 500 Global, we exist to actually bring these weapons of mass creation to as many countries as possible. 
right? We want to arm the local entrepreneurs to rebuild their own economies. Yeah. Okay. So then, what are they going to build? Yeah. Right? So that's yeah. <laughs> that's the thing that we, we you know that's a whole other thing that we talk about, right? Yeah. But most of all, you're building a lot of fundamental things that people need, right? Yeah. You need logistics, infrastructure, e-commerce, fintech, move money faster, right? A lot of SaaS software as service, you know, yeah. a lot of the classic things that need to be built. You know, they will, that's the first part called they build it. Agriculture. Malaysia has this massive opportunity when it comes to agri tech to, to be a real leader in this, right? We have long history of like being leaders with technology and research in terms of agri, whether it's rice, whether it's rubber, right? But fast forward to, to today, like there's a lot we can talk about there. But I just want to kind of loop back, right? You asked me the question, yeah. right? What am I going to do about it? What should VCs like do about this? What's our role to play in the scheme of all these things? Capital is powerful. Yeah, we, and we want to arm it with the right people, yeah. right? Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you first the challenge that I have. Right, on all else equal, some of these things like I look at it and I'm like, okay, this is gonna make a lot of money for my investors, which is important for my investors. But sometimes I'm like, oh, can I exert some kind of, can I exert some kind of influence, not so much on the business, but with the founders themselves, on like how they want to steer it. I'll give you an example: buy now, pay later. Pay the model, by the way. Yeah, I, to me, it's all about the pay later. You yeah. buy now, you're gonna pay later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're in gonna a, pay in for a it. Bad way, right? You're yeah. gonna pay for it, right? Yeah. You, you buy now, you can regret later. You buy now, die later. You know what I mean? There's <laughs> that later part, like yeah. you are shortchanging your present Correct. for some, you know, and you're sorry, you're shorting your future essentially, Correct. right? Correct. Right for a present gain, right? Correct. And of course, like, I can be moralistic about it. Oh, this T20 dude, you know, like can buy whatever he wants today. He doesn't have to do buy now, pay later. Yeah, okay, shoot me for that, right? But the thing is, like, I, I, I do believe in a very big part, like Quartz Mammoth, for example, had the original buy now, pay later. They gave people a lot of basic furniture. Yeah. They gave people electrical appliances, right? Which these things are very, very necessary things to build a household and have to build a home. I think that a lot of this is very good. But when some buy now, pay later is literally like having things like... Uh, Buying useless consumer items, like whatever, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm not even... Gonna talk, I'm just giving an example of non buy now pay later. Even yeah. before buy now pay later, yeah. Korea and Thailand, there are agents that will be in universities financing plastic surgery. And you can uh, make that argument, hey, plastic surgery, makeup, gives you confidence, get a new job, make you feel good about life. Hey, that those are all good things, right? But then there is an edge to all of that. Like yeah. some of these things can go overboard. Okay. And th that therein, the forces and the physics of capitalism lie in there are seeds of some degree of destruction, right? And I feel like humanity has found themselves destroying themselves. You talk about the collapse of societies over time. There's like the overextension and overexertion, which has been there through history. Civilizations don't just destroy each other, they also destroy themselves. Roman empires, like so on and so forth, right? So for us, the current modernity that we are enjoying right now is part of a schema that in it actually has some seeds of destruction. So all I'm saying is that like what I wish to do and what I do and what I tell all my colleagues to do, I say number one, hang out with the founders, connect with them and just make sure that you're friends with them. And so that way you can vibe and you can chill, right? And then you actually like talk about these topics and just get real, right? Like we want our entrepreneurs to build really um, conducive workplaces for people to feel happy and not be in a state of fear. It's something we care about a lot. We care about that founders actually support each other so they don't put themselves through a lot of mental turmoil to be able to build. We had, yeah. we had so far two suicides in our global portfolio. Wow. Founders killing themselves. Wow. Okay? Wow. So a few years ago, I just went a war against suicide. You know, we brought in different coaches. We ran companies through programs. Hey, we just made it a big Overworking, thing. Overworking, stressed out or what? Too much pressure? Okay, when you have a portfolio of 3,000 companies, like some way or another, someone's gonna, you know what I mean? Yeah. You just take, you just take 3,000 entrepreneurs elsewhere, right? Yeah. There is like a statistical probability that something weird is gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, let's yeah. just put that out okay. first, right? Okay. But number two is that, okay, you wanna talk about founder stress? Okay, fine, let's go there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. What I'll say is this a lot of people think stress is about like overworking, which, which that can be a big cause, fine. But it's the stress that eats you when you're not working. That's the one you need to watch out for. What do I mean? One of my closest friends, uh, entrepreneur, like, you know, and then like he, he, he built a very great company um, and it was very good. COVID was hard for everyone. He didn't make it true, right? Now, it, so it, then the company shut down, right? So he's spent the past one year recovering, ashamed, humiliated, you know? He's not even working, bro. He's not even working. But you got all this kind of like inner psychological games you're playing with yourself, right? Yeah. Like who, again, the seeds of destruction, the seeds of collapse, like it's, it's just in his head. Right? Of course, oh, let's go to therapy, blah, 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 get out of it. I mean, it's easy to say that, right? But, you know, but let's say, let's say even like, I'm not talking about like post death of the company, we're talking about say pre death, right? For eight years, when you go to sleep, you don't know if this company's gonna work. 
right? People said, oh, grab, oh, no profitable, blah, blah, blah. You know what kind of like mental fortitude it takes to ask everyone to just 100%. shut up? Do you know what I mean? To just say, hey, everyone just shut up, lah, okay? I, like, I'm not going to be profitable for a while because I'm going to build something that's going to really benefit billions of people, right? <laughs> And I'm going to take all this investor money and we're going to do good, yeah, right? Yeah. During COVID, look at the company I grabbed. They're yeah. helping everybody do all kinds of stuff. How are we going to survive? Yeah. How are people going to get income? Someone going to get ours. Oh, D20, you're going to get your food, huh? Correct, correct. And choose which lasagna you want, right? Correct. So it's like, so I'm, th- I'm talking about like, it takes real grit, right? To go to sleep at night and say, hey, my company might die. Like some of our successful companies, three times in their history, they are one, two weeks to making payroll, right? So it's like, it's like your, so the stress of being a founder sometimes um most of the time has less to do with actually working yeah it's the psychological games that go on in here that when you're not working when you when you go in the toilet when you're in the shower before you go to bed when you kiss your wife are you actually thinking about your wife or not or your husband for that matter right it's like what are you actually thinking about where's your mind right so i think that kind of stress is like the deliberating one yeah i think a lot of people don't realize but uh, li- life is like it's a single player game right it's everything's in your head yeah. wasn't me who said there was naval ravikant who said that right really smart guy vc as well no, no, I, I like his stuff yeah. yeah yeah so the thing is um the thing is now tech is in a really strange place because f- for want of a better reason um tech is being driven by interest rates and central bank policy and all that which I think is part of the reason why, you know, the Buka Lapas of this world and the travel locusts of this world and the grabs of this world, they're trading way, way below their listing price. Right? It's a tr- huge travesty. But then again, you can say 20 years ago, Amazon was also yes. n- like single bucks, right? Yeah. Losing money, hand over fist, right? Yeah, 20 years of losing money. Yeah. Correct, correct. So where's the tech world now in terms of VCs and you have a 10-year horizon to make a return on your money, right? Where are we now? In, in okay, terms of so f- f- first thing I'd say is that yeah. like, to demand a company to make profits yeah. is like a justified request. Yeah. Okay, that's the first thing I'll say just now, you know, I, you know, So I, the world I, has changed because last time valuations, right? It doesn't matter you lost money, right? Yeah, yeah uh, but but you know, that, that, that also, I'll say that it doesn't matter what season it is, asking a company to have a path for profitability or plan for profitability or a theoretical model on how profitability actually happens is basic. It's one-on-one. And no entrepreneur, there's no entrepreneur like who is super happy like having a company that will never, ever, ever be profitable. Right now, however, okay, maybe some two cycles, lah, right? Who maybe like, but that that cycles exist in every industry. But I see for the but for the most point, it's like um, what I'm trying to say is that like it's it's justified to ask for profits at any season, okay? But number two is that growth. Like, what are you actually trying to build in what horizon? So some investors have a shorter horizon, so they'll be they'll be like, hey, look, I want to see profits today. I want to see dividends. Then those kind of investors will buy a lot of dividend stocks and they want to see cash flows, right? Then when they're trying to build a company, they're not trying to build Grab. They're not trying to build Kasim. They're, they're going to build, uh, they can build a, a, a the, what's that, Village Park Nasi Lemak. Dude, that guy's like minting it, man. Yeah. Right? Today, it's, it's right. Cash, today, yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. cash minting machine. But if you sell Nasi Lemak, first month you can break even already. First month mm. you can profit already. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, and, and there are people who, right now, urban people who, who chase the, the Village Park dream and are selling Nasi Lemak as well, right? I, on Instagram, I follow this one guy, he's like rapping and selling his Nasi Lemak. He's like so cool, right? But anyways, it's like, <laughs> but what I mean to say is that like as entrepreneurs or investors, you're choosing a horizon. Yeah. And you're choosing a lifestyle. You're choosing a game to play. Yeah. Right? And this is why some people right right now maybe they don't want to play certain uh, hype games, right? And so the hype games which are the momentum traders, they've been trading on tech, they've been trading on like ICOs back then before web3, then they're trading on web3 projects, then they're trading on crypto, right? Some of these and then they trade on stocks too. Momentum Right back then, like Tesla was a momentum stock for yeah. the most part, and yeah. now it's proven itself to some degree to being like potentially getting into the realm of like, you know, okay, but let's not talk about Tesla yeah. yet. Okay, <laughs> we'll save that for later. But you know, but, but all I'm saying is that you can be a value trader, you can be a momentum trader, and you need to choose your horizon, and then so you don't go and sh- crap on somebody else's asset class, but that was never your game in the first place. Correct. Right. right? Yeah. So where's your headspace in terms of how you evaluate? I think you talk about three thousand companies, about how many of them in Southeast Asia, right? So when you look at companies, what what fires you? What yeah. I mean, what fires you in terms of putting money to work? Because I think yeah. you're one of those investors that put small bets for small stakes, right? Yeah. Right, playing roulette line, yeah. in other words, right? A lot of spread them yeah, out. Yeah, right? I'll talk. I'll talk. Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about that. Like yeah. I, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, like this. It's like, why are you bragging about how many companies you've invested in, right? Mm. It's about like, you know, some a lot of VCs they can do a portfolio of ten companies, right? And then like, you know, and then they're and all they're done, right? Yeah. yeah, and then they get one and done, right? But the thing is, I'm not playing a venture capital game. You know, I, didn't, I was six years old. I asked, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up in your kindergarten? I didn't, oh, I want to be a venture capitalist. It's not, it's not no, what it is, man. No, yeah. it's, I think all of us, to some degree, we're very creative individuals. I think the creative spirit, spirit creativity, I mean, if you're a religious, talk about the creator and all that, right? I think we, we embody that. But what is our mode of creation? What is our mode of expression, 
right? So I'm like some, like just like everybody else, like lost and confused growing up and everything. But eventually I'm like, wow, the business is a beautiful canvas. Yeah. Right? So venture capital is actually just a, a, a way I can communicate, like the way I can describe, at least like a vehicle that I can use to actually co-create. So when you co-create with entrepreneurs and you kind of empower them to actually co-create and work with them to actually co-create a lot of things, like that activity in and of itself is a lot of intrinsic value. Like every day, like I told you like earlier before walking into the studio, like yesterday I had like 15 meetings, day before I had 13 meetings, right? It's like, but I get energy. You say, hey, how do you do 15 meetings a day? I'm like, whoa, you're meeting some of the most energetic people who are like entrepreneurs who have risked a lot of things to believe in something that nobody believes in. Like that's a, that's, this is potent. They're like walking batteries, you know? And they don't like express themselves in a, a, a you know, in the way that maybe I'm a bit animated. Like sometimes I'm like, chill, right? But there's a fire in there, right? Yeah. So I think number one, you asked me like, what, what, you know, I think this is the, the sport, right? The sport. Second thing is, if you're a fireman, or let's say you're a Forex trader, you have professional training. You're a media guy, right? So you're talking to me, your brain is like processing, hey, what's the story here? Hey, well, how's it going to, you know? Your, your brain's firing up a certain way because you are professionally trained and your brain, the dopamine loops, you know, the circuitry, the electricity has run the same roads many times, right? So it's forged already, right? Yeah, yeah. For venture capital, you're trained to be curious. You're trained to be non-judgmental and curious. Every entrepreneur has some wacky idea. Yeah. Some of them are very reasonable ideas and you have to see through it. You're trained to be very, very curious. Um, and then like number two is that you're trained to be, uh, to start quantifying things. If you start, start quantifying and say, hey, that's a really good idea, then you have to think, hey, how is it going to make money? How much money is it going to need to grow to what stage here? So you start to quantify and start a structure. And when you quantify something financially, you're plugging it to the operating system of the day, which is capitalism, right? So you're being curious, you're finding out what's this real story over here, and then you're trying to start to quantify things. Thirdly, is that you're trying to imagine, you're trying to build. So you think like, oh, okay, so if like this is the idea, and then it's probably potentially could be worth this much, mm, okay, so how do we get this done? Then you try a solution. So it just so happens that this sport of venture capital, I chose this sport, you know, like some people choose tennis or ultra marathons or whatever. This sport, when I'm 90 years old, I'll be able to do it. It's a sport that, let's say my body is like gone already, my mind's like, mm, you know, I can be curious. You come and talk to me, oh, hey, young, whatever. Like I can, I can still be curious about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can just kind of like understand like the, the quantification, the financialization of it. I'm like, oh, okay, so what has to be done, young man, you know, whatever. <laughs> so I, I can still do it, I'm 90, right? So, so I think it's like a beautiful sport and it trains you to be more human. You know, I talk to so many like uh, 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 gig economy people, I befriend people that I work with because I'm just curious about the world. So I think firstly, there's intrinsic energetic joy of venture. Number two is that like it trains you to be a more compassionate human, which I believe so, and more curious human. But the third thing is the stuff we talked about earlier. There is crazy levels of economic impact and stories of hope. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I know I'm elaborating, but this is a long form podcast, so I'm gonna take advantage of it, is that when we launch our Istanbul fund, our Turkey fund, and I still remember this because it's so dramatic, right? We had this offside, all of our partners from different parts of the world. We flew in together, all celebrating. We're like, hey, where's Rina? So Rina was a person who, uh, who, who led and built our, uh, our, our, our first um, Istanbul fund, our Turkey fund. She didn't come to the airport to cut her phones. Istanbul airport was bombed. Oh, shit. Right? So, like, hey, Rina, are you okay? She said, hey, I'm fine, I'm fine. I just need to take, I'll, I'll take the next flight out. Okay? So she finds herself a flight and she lands in San Francisco. And... Newspaper, she had a picture of a newspaper, front page, okay, Istanbul airport got bombed. On the side over there, 500 launches a new fund. <laughs> oh shit, talk about bad news, right? Bad, bad timing. No, it's good timing. Stories of hope versus stories of fear. Stories nice. of grief versus stories of hope, right? Nice. That's what we're here to do. Every founder is a story. Every entrepreneurial success and failure is a story to be told. And these are the stories that hopefully will inspire other people to be part of this creative activity. And if someone in the middle of nowhere, Malaysia, like myself, who's come from very ordinary upbringing, you know, my parents, my dad, he's got 11 siblings. They saved their life savings for him to actually get a degree. So he bought a computer, which he still does not know how to use till today, right? So that his kids, like me and my brothers, can use computers. That's why I learned how to code. And that's why I can build media companies that I can list on Bursa and sell to Media Prima. And, and then I can also like fund a lot of companies and do the same thing for everybody else. Now, this kind of story is a hope and involving more people in this creative endeavor is, is it's even more powerful if you do it in Malaysia, if you do it in East Malaysia, if you go even further into some other countries in the world, another hundred countries out there that sometimes you, you're choosing, name your country, choose your country, then you're scrolling, you're like, hey, what's this country? Uh? You know, let's bring it there. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And then I feel like everyone's going to be involved in this party of capitalism yeah, and not yeah. be left out. That chain of causation is so interesting to me because if it wasn't for the fact that 10 siblings helped one yeah. who then yeah, bought the computer, water. yeah, who then, you know, obviously who then bought a computer, who then benefited his kids, yes. then you would have Kadiang and then blah, 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 and then 500 and says and all that, right? Let's, let's, let, let's go back to the past for a little while, Kylie. Um, mm. Not every entrepreneur can become a venture capitalist, right? Not every tennis player can become a tennis coach, right? So how did that path happen for you? Um, I think everyone, I think that, okay. Okay, let me unpack that. I think not every entrepreneur wants to be a VC, okay. you know, to be an investor. It's, it's a very different game, right? As an entrepreneur, you exert more control. As a venture capitalist, you exert a little bit less sometimes, right? Or a different type of control, right? Um, a different kind of influence. So I don't think everyone wants to. Uh, for me, it's that like I contemplated deep and hard. Earlier on you asked me, oh, Kylie, how old are you, right? And like, do you have a midlife crisis right now or what, right? I told, I told you I'm having a renaissance right now. I'm in whale yeah. of time. Yeah. Because as far as crisis is concerned, it was actually after I sold my companies, then yeah. I've lost my identity, right? Because building that media company and then later building the e-commerce company with my co-founder, Joe O'Neill, we, that, that we sold to Groupon. I was age 30, you know, sitting on some money and I didn't have anything to do. Because like the entrepreneur doesn't have companies to operate anymore, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't have people to, you know, my staff members to rally, you know, to set goals and do things, you know. So it's like, then what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to relax? Am I supposed to retire now? Like, what am I going to do, right? So that was the beginning of inquiry. Yeah. Right. And it was that chapter where I really is. You talk about the mind games with yourself, right? I said, okay, all right, man, you want to go there? Let's go there, right? And then. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Okay, so I went in one direction where yeah. I was highly consumptive. I've written about this publicly, so I'm okay to talk about it here yeah. on your podcast. I was like buying a lot of useless shit. I was a god of buying useless things. I didn't even know I had that capacity to shop, right? I just <laughs> wardrobe, I had clothes I never worn. I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I'll wear this or something sometime. And, then just, I know, just, and like, now you've got a G-Shock right? on your wrist. Yeah, so I bought a lot of dumb shit and they're all yeah. very cheap because I think I was brought up in such a cheap family. So it's just like, <laughs> you know, right? So it's not like no luxury goods, okay? This is, like, I was at like Bajar Times Square shopping, okay? So I wasn't like blowing out bling, but I'm talking about a lot of it's just unnecessary. So it's buying unnecessary stuff. Then uh, because I had so much time with my own thoughts, right? When I buy something, I can actually have the conversation. And the turning point to me was actually this very distinct salt and pepper shaker. It's the shape <laughs> of a fox. Okay, so this is the narrative I had with that salt and pepper shaker. Right? I'm like, yo, this is so cute and interesting that like, I'm going to buy this salt and pepper shaker. Then when our friends come over for dinner, they'll be like, oh, that's so interesting. Where do you get that? Right? And they think I'm an interesting person. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped myself. I'm like, man, this, this is not going in the right direction. And you're like 30 years old and like, you're, try you're just like, you're buying things so that you want to feel interesting. Like, yeah. do you not feel interesting? Yeah. Do you not love yourself enough yeah, that you yeah. need to buy something that you know Sanjay, I was talking to Sanjay the yeah, other day, yeah, right? Yeah, SB, yeah. yeah SB guy, right? And then I don't know what the hell we're talking about. We're having our own podcast, right? Without any, uh, uh, but we are, I, I shared with him about uh, like uh, an observation of luxury goods. I think that if your self-worth is this and then it's like a bit lower, you're going to be willing to pay the delta yeah, of, yeah. to have that brand worth supplement that self-worth. Yeah. Like you want to feel like this yeah. and you can't feel like this on your own, you're going to buy something to help yourself feel like this. Absolutely, right? 100%. So you, you're going to, yeah. that, that delta, and that's where luxury goods actually make their margin yeah. and their margin is so big yeah. because they say, yo, you probably want to feel like this, yes. but you don't feel like this right now. Yes. You probably need that, right? Yeah. And this is, of course, you know, like different people buy things for different reasons, but I think that's one thing I wanted to share. But anyways, coming back to that was that the turning point for me was like, hey, why am I buying all this useless stuff? Number two is that the reason was because I was actually like searching for some degree of validation or some degree, you know, like what? You built and sold two companies by 30 and you, you know, you with, with a very everyday education, right? I didn't go to any kind of like good schools at all, right? It's and completely self-made don't you have enough validation already, right? Why do you still need to buy a salt and pepper shaker with a ship of a fox, right? So I said, hey, that's the problem there. I, I, have to, I have to start cleansing my mind. So then I said, okay, well, I'm going to start cleansing my mind, start auditing these things. And then, so I stopped shopping completely. I got rid of a ton of distractions, right? I even stopped because I was also, happened to somehow become single at the time too, right? So very dangerous, right? So I said, <laughs> hey, yeah. So I, I stopped any kind of engagement with any, you know, any, anything that's uh, romantic or, or erotic for that matter. None. Even like personally consumptive, erotic stuff, none, right? None, right? There's no, none. That, so I went like monk mode for months. And it was in that tunnel of that, of, of, of that cave, right? My own psychological cave that I came around to say, look, your 
happiness is limited when you only think about yourself. And we are biologically armed with mirror neurons, right? How you feel and how I feel, like we're communicating emotion right now. Our limbic systems are connect- connected yeah. because we have mirror neurons to communicate. Yeah. And why some people are sad when the sports team fails, when the sports team loses, their favorite tennis player, oh, why did Djokovic lose to that other guy, that Mexican dude, oh, I love Djokovic or whatever, right? Then they're like sad the next day. Why? Because they've connected their hearts to, they've connected themselves, you know, they've connected themselves to Djokovic or to Arsenal or Manchester United or whatever you name, right? Or to your wife or to your kids. Like there's a connection point there. So I felt very alive when I can connect myself and everything that I've been given, all the good fortune and all these things I've picked up, if I can kind of like connect that to other folks, like that's going to be a multiplication of this sensory or this ex- this human experience is going to be multiplied, multiplied beyond the physical confines that I've given to myself, right? I started angel investing. I said some other guy from my school, I went to SMK at Masarajaya, right? Um, everyday government school. Uh, so this is why I got coaching, right? Facebook messages me, back when Facebook was a thing, <laughs> Facebook messages me out of blue and says, yo, I'm also from your school. I got this idea. You want to help me out? First angel wow, investment I did. Cool, First cool, angel cool. I did. I said, yo, okay, come over to my house. I, mean, I didn't know what I'm like. What I'm like. So I said, I, just, I wanted to follow that thread, right? Hey, yeah. let me care about this dude. Yeah. Let me let me help this guy win in the same way I won. Let me help him win. He wants to win in the same way I managed to win. Let me go and help him. Just comes to my house. You know, I still have the web design in me. I designed his logo, you know, built his website for him some more, right? I got some other person to do the coding of it. You know, we just talk about a business model, sketched it out, everything. You know, you got to bring out a co-founder, sketched it out, paper and pen, you know. Fast forward a few years later, the majority acquired by iSelect, right? One of the, then the founders made out of some money. Uh, there are two co-founders, they brought in another guy, sends me a picture of the sketch I drew for them the wow, very first day, cool, right? With a bottle cool. of wine. Even the amount of money that they would want to walk away with, right, was the exact amount, dude. No way. I'm telling you, life is very freaky like that. And I had many of those experiences on my own. Like, you just write something and then you just leave it in your drawer. And something. Like, hey, actually, it's the same thing, right? Like, the amount of money I sold, the first exit I had wasn't actually the sales.com one. It's actually the Groupon one, right? And then, like, when I quit my first job, I worked at Mind Valley. This other company is my first job, right? And then, like, uh, when I quit Mind Valley, I didn't have a job. But I knew I wanted to build and sell a company for a certain amount. I wrote that amount and I kept it in my drawer. And then when the term sheet came from Groupon to Aquaria, I was like, oh, shit, it's the exact same freaking amount. How do you... I don't know about your life, but my life's been a little bit like, like woo, you know what I mean? Like this, like this weird things happen, and then, uh, but they're good things, you know? How do you intellectualize exactly what you just talked about? That whole reverse engineering, you know, um, uh, visualizing thing. Everybody, well, some people talk about it, right? I think uh, uh, I, I can't ha- half echo out of it. You know, they talk about it, right? How do you intellectualize that? Like, you're talking about T half echo? You're talking about Eckhart Tolle? Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle? Yeah, okay. Eckhart Tolle, right. Oh, you want to go there, huh? So no, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily, right? But you know, when you, when you visualize something in the future, <laughs> right? Business, podcast, you know. We're <laughs> I don't know what this is, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you know, you, you'll, you'll call it what you want, right? Yeah. Some people believe in the power of prayer if that's yeah. like the kind of modality that they kind of subscribe to. You know, some <laughs> some folks can... You're talking about some degree of like kind of karmic influence or whatnot, right? You can talk about destiny. You can rationalize it in a number of ways, right? Now, the way I do it, the way I do it, is that I feel there is a biological basis to this. I think there is an actual physics basis to a lot of this stuff, right? Firstly, um, it, you know, I've not like dissected the, the science of this alone, right? But on just on surface, the reticular activation system, the RAS, they call it, right? Let's say you wanted to buy a MyV, right? But previously, you didn't want to buy, buy a MyV, but you want to buy a brown MyV, okay? Suddenly on the road, you're like, what can I mean? like, wow, a lot of brown myvia. Suddenly, all of a sudden, it's brown yeah, myvia. That's the universe up. serving the stuff. It's like the YouTube algorithm, right? Yes, but but we, the YouTube, we, we adjusted our own algorithm to feed ourselves the brown myvia. Yeah. Right? So if you want to buy an electric vehicle, right? And then you're looking at the Volvo, whatever, like, right? then suddenly you're seeing all these Volvos, or whatever yeah, you have yeah, you, right? Yeah. So this reticular activation system is really, really important to actually be aware of like what is what, what algorithm have you designed for yourself to filter content? Right? Okay, we can bring this back to media, right? So we're trying to filter content here with our brains, right? Yeah. So it's like the goals that you set and the things that you're trying to attract, the thoughts that you have, the recurring habit loops, the questions you want to ask. Tony Robbins talked about primary question. Some people's primary question they walk around every day is that like, does this person like me? 
right? Some people think about that, right? Like, and even they're not teenagers, by the way, right? So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's, you know that's a concerning part. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. the thing is, like, for primary question, some people is like, how can I make more money? Yeah. Every day they look at how I make more money, and that yeah, you know, I'm not again no moral judgment. I'm just saying that look, everyone's got primary question. That's Tony Robbins stuff, right? But I'm just giving you that material because that is part of that larger idea about the reticular activation system. Like, what is it? What is the algorithm we're filtering for right now that filters all these things that actually is like floating through our eyes, right? I think that's the first point. So for me, when I kind of like have an energized about a vision or a certain goal, right? Like I don't like think about it obsessively all the time, but it does affect like if you, we talk about cellular integrity, I talked about a, a while back with you, is that your bones feel it, your cells feel it. Like you feel really aligned with a goal. Everyone set like New Year's resolutions to lose weight or to like, you know, gain muscle or whatever, have you get more healthy, na na na, right? But have you, like once it's really, like it's really conditioned into your mind and your body and you totally, uh, your, your complete alignment with it, like it's going to happen. That, that's what I believe. Yeah. And it's it's going to happen because the reticular activation system is lit, number one. Number two is that the energy system flows towards the direction you want it to go. Okay, let me talk about the opposite because sometimes you talk about the opposite it's easy yes. to explain things, right? Yes. Now, why do we self-sabotage our own goals? Right? We don't have absolute alignment and there's some self-sabotage over there. I'll give you, so for example, let's talk about money, okay? That's why I'm getting rich, okay? Why some people, they want to get richer but they don't? Some parts of it is that they have certain beliefs about people who are rich. They said, hey, a lot of rich people are unethical or they had to do something dirty to get there, you know, or like, and it, I'm not saying that that does not happen. I'm pretty sure in that, especially like previous generations, right? There's a certain way of accumulating wealth that, you know, it was, a, was also a construct of the conditions of the time, right? These days it's harder to be unethical and there are more punishments, right? But some people tend to believe because maybe they got it for their uncle or they read some story or maybe they need a story to assure themselves to keep themselves in the same, you know, to, to, to they, maybe they're more comfortable being not rich than rich, right? So they weave a story, right? So I've got a friend who like uh, felt that people who have a lot of muscles, they're assholes. <laughs> they're jocks. <laughs> they're these asshole jocks, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because, because in high school, they were yeah. like, oh, just jacked up dudes and yeah, he's yeah, just yeah. like, yeah, this guy, Lancy or whatever, you know? So he's got a certain <laughs> judgment on people who are physically jacked up. And then, like, and then he'd, he'd believe that they had nothing else better to do but to work out all the time, right? <laughs> but he also wants to be fit. How, how are you going to be fit? Yeah, yeah. You don't want to be an asshole, yeah. right? So one of your goals conflicts with another goal, right? You're like, I don't want to be an asshole goal versus like, I want to be fit goal. Like, you know, so you don't have, to, your energy is going to be stifled. It's gonna, you're going to be stuck, Yeah. right? Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So your thoughts, your habits, they, they come and align to, to, to what you want to get. But if you don't have those thoughts, I mean, if you fill your mind with negative stories which make you riled up and, and angry and if you eat junk food all the time, okay. but you want to get fit, you're not going to get fit, right? Yeah. All these presuppositions yeah. about how rich people are and they're yeah. assholes and all, all right, it doesn't get you there. Okay, I'm going to give you something else, right? This is probably the best way to do it, right? Because if you say on the level of like tactics and actions, I mean, that's very valuable. But where you see a lot of shifts is actually on the level of identity. So the identity part and the construct of our own identities, even as a nation, so I want to bring this back out to like nation building because you, you began with that, right? And media, but identity. That level is like the crucible. Why? A lot of people may describe themselves as a foodie. So if you're a foodie and you want to be fit, you'd better be a real gym junkie as well. Because the caloric neutralization of being a foodie, like you, you want to look a certain way or feel a certain way, like you have to exercise a lot, yeah, right? Yeah. To be a non-obese foodie. <clears throat> you know, you have to have a certain level. So if you're an extreme foodie, you need to be, you know, so all I'm saying is that that's an example of goals which like do not align, but because of the identity you adopt. So what you call yourself, how you describe yourself. Early on, and you say you, you describe, hey, I'm a media guy, I'm a broadcast guy. Because you've been, of course, that's your profession and you've done this very, very well and very successfully with your career, right? But you also know, and you're very self-aware, that you're more than that, right? But you use that label, that becomes the lens. Mm -hmm. That becomes the RAS, right? That's it for me. People say, hey, Kali, are you a VC? I'm like, I'm like no, 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 I'm not a VC. You know, like I, I try to like, I'm like a creative spirit and I'm finding expression. I'm finding beautiful expression, right? Venture capital is one of these things. Yeah. So from an identity standpoint, I get the option value of taking a different lens as a non-venture capital lens, right? Even in this podcast, you want to talk about human lens? Let's talk about human lens. You want to talk about geopolitics? Let's talk about geopolitics, which we, which we can go for as well, right? Yeah. We can talk about these things, yeah. right? Because I don't want to be attached to one lens, Yeah. right? And so that identity level, I think that's where you can really shift, right? So, so the challenge you're talking with someone like you, um, in most interviews, I'll be very honest, right? It's very clear the path of discussion, but with you, 
in your reply, which typically lasts about five, six minutes, which is a long time, right? <laughs> which is good. No, which is okay. good. Not not many Malaysians can speak so well, right? There's 25 different things to go off into offshoots with. With you, that's like, I'm thinking, bloody hell, where do, where do we go next? Yeah, right? you, you got to choose, right? Yeah, correct. Choose correct. your own adventure, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so now I'm thinking, where the hell? Right, right. So the thing is, um, I wanted to ask you, how does a 30-year-old with, with a very ordinary background become like a, someone who's exited two companies by the age of 30? That's one way, right? The other thing is, um, with this whole self-actualization and, and you know, um, quality in, quality out, shit in, shit out, right? I think I'm going to ask you this, okay? Um, what is your process what what are the what are your behavioral um, processes on a daily basis which get you to where you want to go? Because it's very clear that you know where you want to go, and then you make it happen, right? So, in some sense. So, so, what's your day like? Um, what do you read? What workouts do you do? How do you conduct meetings? You know, how do you structure a day, twenty four hours? Okay. So I think the first thing is that on the note of like um, transcending different topics yeah. in a podcast and like um, branching and pulling it together, I think what w- I'd like to do to, with this podcast as well is that I can actually bring it all together, right, into like a unified theory and unified model, right, on like how I choose to live and the kind of existence that I have, right, mm. and then so then I'll break that down. That answer is going to be more than five minutes, right, but but it actually is a synthesis, right? yeah. so we can yeah. bring this to a synthesis, yeah. right, and this synthesis is not about me. Right, because whether I live and die, and when I live and die, right, this synthesis to me is a. I'm trying to signal what is the next adaptation for the human race. What is the next step beyond the society we know? Right, I, th- which is why algorithmically, I don't really like playing to the existing algorithm. I don't like being part of the existing system because I have seen that a lot of us we are trying to adapt to what is arising, the new challenges that are we are faced with. Right, but the rest of us we're still wanting things to be like the old days. We're still wanting things to have the same conditions, the same physics, you know, that that that, that we've enjoyed, yeah. right? And we're still perpetuating this historical nostalgia of the, you know, and, and I think that's the enemy of the future. So, so I'm going to bring this to a synthesis, right? But first, if you want to ask more casually, like about my day, uh, so I'm plant-based, vegan, uh, been there for seven years, you know, so my wife and I were both uh, vegan. Um, and you, the way you described it, it was like, oh, you know, you've achieved all these things. You must have some specific, like, the, what is your routine and all that, right? I'll tell you that, like, I am a complete mess in a lot of ways. And I feel like most, that there is probably a large uh, swath of very successful people that, uh, or, or semi-successful people uh, that, that, that people idolize and look up to. And some days they got their shit together and some days they don't, right? And so I think that, <laughs> that's so for the most part, if like, like most of your days you have your shit together, okay, good on you, right? You can get somewhere. My larger theory is of adaptation and about living with dysfunction. My larger theory about my personal rituals and my personal day is that like I have um, I have a lot of days where I feel that things have I've 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 lived out the day like in a way where I think it's great, right? But a lot of days which is complete mess. And if I can accept that dysfunction and still be of service to other people and the goals that I've set, okay, I, I'm alright. I don't have very high standards for my day, right? <laughs> so I think, and when it comes to companies too, as an investor, you yeah. can look at any company in your portfolio and say, hey, this is, something's wrong here, something's wrong there, something's wrong there. Then you meet the founder, you're like, hey, these five things are wrong. Hey, this one's also wrong, that one's also wrong. How do you think the founder's going to feel? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And you look at the biggest, most successful companies in the world, right? You want to talk market cap, let's look at NVIDIA, right? You go in there, there's like so much dysfunction. Big nations, very powerful, strong, and functioning societies have a healthy dose of dysfunction. Like you talk about Scandinavians, oh, they are so happy all the time. Da, 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 da. There's a lot of weird dysfunction over oh, there. Yeah, man. yeah, I mean, you get accused of not taking care of a child, you know, suddenly like the government takes away your own kid, you know what I mean? Yeah, There's a lot yeah. of stuff that happens that is highly dysfunctional too. Yeah. Malaysia is not the only dysfunctional country in the world, okay? Just wake up call, right? <laughs> like there's dysfunction everywhere, right? Yeah. So I think that like we have to embrace this dysfunction and knowing that we need to take steps forward in our lives, even though we're carrying grief from a loss of loved one, even though we're carrying like a trauma, right? From a teenage rejection, you know, from also and so forth, right? We, we, we are taking steps forward with dysfunction. Okay, let's talk about adaptation. So what are we going to do today that's adaptive, right? To something that we don't want. What is this country going to do that is adaptive in the short term and in the long term, right? What kind of thoughts, what kind of content are we going to put out that we feel is actually adaptive in a in a functional way. So I think you have dysfunctions and you got functional adaptations, right? Okay, now to the simple question of my day, right? Is that like I, I kinda like try to I mean I try to like stock it with a lot of uh, meetings which I feel like are very important to move my agenda forward. And then I like to do them back to back. I like to have a lot of momentum with them. 
So I try to clock in like 13 to 15 of it. I, I, I work out uh, five times a week on minimum. You know, some, some weeks I, I really enjoy myself. I get to knock out about eight workouts, right? And they'll mix up. None of them are heavy and intense. You know, now I'm doing a lot of weights. I'm trying to put some muscle, right? Um, so I always make sure I have my workouts. Um, my food, like I've really pre-planned a lot of my food. You know, I have the good fortune of having a helper to help me prepare some of this food, right? So I just bring boxes of food to work to eat. You know, I don't have like a goal of like social fitting in. So I bring boxes of food to events. I had a business meeting once upon a time in Phuket. They take me out for food. And I carry my own boxes that I prepared <laughs> from home. You know what I mean? Like I just like eating a certain way, right? Yeah, so yeah. so that's, that's it, right? Um, so I feel like the uh, if I got regimen and structure with my workouts and I have regimen structure with my food and I'm obsessive about getting good sleep, which you know it's a struggle for me sometimes because I also like working those two conflicting goals over there right so I like sleeping and I like working oh my god what am I going to do right? yeah, so there's yeah. two conflicting goals there yeah. but I actually do clock in on average it's been two years I clock in average seven hours of sleep so I think that's a huge achievement for me because I used to do four or five right so hence like I think the um, getting structure the short answer is getting structure around food getting stru uh, a structure around uh, exercise and getting a structure around um, sleep I think it's just like basic for me then everything else I can pack in the meetings I want to have Right, spend the time with the people that I, that I want to spend time with, and weekends with my wife. That's like also like I like. She also has to make effort because she also likes working the same amount as I do. Right, she's in social work. She's a social worker. Right, so that work is infinite. Right, so it's like, so we say, okay, this Saturday, you don't cancel, huh? you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Parents, you know, every 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 now and then, you know, I just try to make make sure I have dinner with my parents, you know, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why uh, earlier I asked you about uh, midlife crisis and all that, because I think you've reached a certain vintage in your life. Yeah. You've had certain times. I think you've been very vintage. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, because okay, yeah. I don't want to say. I, I don't think you want okay, me to say okay. right. So um, um, you've been quite quiet media wise the last couple of years. I think intentionally, yes. lah. Yes. Um, it's quite clear that you're someone who reflects a lot. You've yeah. you've reached certain conclusions about many things in, in in the world, right? But at the same time, you're also an ultra hard worker. So I I want to get into your mind in terms of um. At this vintage, which is not even half your life, like, potentially, because of the way you're you, you, you conducted from a health perspective, um, what conclusions have you reached um, in, in your reflection about, about the world? I mean, you've you talked about a lot of them already, right? But what are the things that people should know in trying to make sense of the shit that's happening in the world? Mm. Okay. I know that's very so open, far. right? Yeah. No, no, no. no. It's good because you're inviting this synthesis as well. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so I have a few uh, things that through my actions I work on, right? So it's not stuff that I just think about, but like this is like the body of work. This is like my life's work. Yeah. So the first off is, I'm going to give a long setting, right? And then I'm going to synthesize it. Is that you and I and anyone who's listening to this right now, we're, we, we happen to be incarnated or existing or, or at least conscious in a certain sliver of time. Now in this sliver of time, the capitalist operating system is the primary operating system. There is, of course, yeah, so that's the primary one. Um, it's not overly pervasive, but it's largely pervasive. The second thing is, we are the cusp of actually understanding the physics of market forces when in an intangible world. What do I mean? We are talking about new economy. Many ideas you can attach to it. But the big realization is that you can trade, you can exist, you can monetize, you can influence beyond your body, beyond the realm of physical touch, right? Beyond reach, right? And so that's where information technology, ooh, ICT, you know, it's like, and then the algorithms, the TikTok, the everything, you know, it's like, that's, that's, we are aware of it. But does 8 billion people know the levers to play with it? You compare this to the physical world, right? People have been doing martial arts for years. And back then, physical warfare is important. Military, and military is still important, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like, hand-to-hand -hand combat was very important. Right? That's why there's like big schools of martial arts. In fact, some people just go through martial arts education their whole life, but maybe not okay. much else. Okay. You know, maybe a thousand years ago, right? So I think that humanity has um, gotten very familiar with some of the physical aspects of the human experience. But this era, we're starting to get into um, some fluency with working intangibly. Hence, you can be 90 year old and sitting in some wheelchair, hopefully not, you know, um, okay, 19 year, 90 years and doing parkour yeah. and, and, and still be able to actually engage in the world very meaningfully yeah. through whatever means there is that's intangible, right? Yeah. And countries, yeah. it doesn't matter how much oil you have. It doesn't matter how much like agricultural resources you have. It doesn't matter how many population you have. Countries like Singapore, Israel, Estonia, they punch way above their weight class because they understand like the levers and the physics of intangible world. So, 
With that in mind, the superpowers that's dominated the economic spectacle of prior decades, right? You got Evander versus Holyfield, or sorry, so Holyfield versus like uh, Tyson, right? Tyson versus Holyfield or whatnot. You got these heavyweights of China and the US, right? So a lot of the previous stories that, oh, US superpower, okay, US is the good one that destroyed the evil Russians and whatnot. You know, so you have a lot of these like storylines and narratives that are pervasive. And yes, economically, they set the standard. Everyone's trading on US dollars, you know, and okay, they go there. Then China is challenging them. And then now they're, okay, China's maybe going to overtake them in some sense. Okay, so that's like the two market leaders, right? Now, but the story for the rest of us, like we, we grew up in Malaysia, man. Yeah. Like we, we didn't grow up there. And then, oh, oh Malaysia's so small compared to this. And, and, and. So you got this, you know what they call countries like us, bruh? Developing countries, you know. So there's this semantic prison that has been casted upon yeah. so many countries because you're developing. I'm an adult, you're a child. You know what I mean? You're still developing, right? And nothing against those terms because it gives us a language to talk about, but it's not very empowering. Whereas in business, if you're an incumbent in a market, you're high growth. Yeah, you're high growth. And, and you're, and not, not so much if you're incumbent, you're actually low growth most of the time. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but, but, but if you're the market leader, yeah. You are market leaders. So China and US, they are market leaders. The rest of us, we're actually called challengers. Mm. So if you look at any brand strategy, challenger strategy, look at any kind of business strategy and challenger strategies, challenger strategies are different. They're not called developing companies. They're called challenger companies, right? So I would argue a way, a lens that's very empowering is challenger nations. Malaysia is a challenger nation. The tactics you deploy in the in business, if you're a challenger, is different from the tactics you employ as an incumbent or a market leader. So for us as challenger nations, because of this transcendence beyond physical necessity, we're in this intangible new economy, R4.0, whatever you call it, type of world, we can actually do a lot more. We can punch way above our weight class because of this ability. Hence, all of the challenger nations, it is really upon us to leverage and pull those levers so that we are not just innocent bystanders or spectators in the Tyson and Holyfield or kind of like the, the market leaders, the world superpowers puppeteering, right? We can decide. U.S. and China, like, they want allies. You know, suddenly, the, all the foreign embassies and the foreign ministries of U.S., suddenly they wake up with a job to do already, right? Because it's, they have to befriend all the little ones everywhere else, right? And, and we, I'm sure a lot of your guests have talked a lot about this, so I won't go into this so much detail. But the first big realization is that we are existing in this plane and this sliver, this timestamp right now, that we are learning how to pull different levers of an intangible world. And nations, I'll start at the nation level, then we go on to professional, go on to the personal. In the, um, in, the, in, the, in, in the national realm, challenger nations is a concept and a way of looking at things where we can deploy different strategies. Okay, what are those strategies? The main strategy, which again cuts into this intangible uh, uh, level, right, is we need to own our own new economy stack, our own digital stack. And stack is a tech term, la. it's like, you know, your hardware, your software and everything, right? And connectivity and so on and so forth. We need to own a lot of it. For far too long, challenger nations has, have in the plight to, have, uh, to, to build more uh, P&L for the country. And, and uh, a lot of its institutions had rightfully invested in Silicon Valley. Because Silicon Valley, for, as far as venture is concerned, like they're the new economy leaders, right? They're the pioneers, they know everything, right? So invested there, good returns, great outsized returns, okay. You trade off new economy knowledge and understanding, and then you get some cash. But what have you done? You fed the beast. Silicon Valley continues to race ahead. And they say, is it because they're smarter? Is it because they have like Stanford next to them? No, it's because you funded them. Mm. No, 100%. <laughs> right? They funded themselves too, but a lot of countries around the world, the sovereign wealth institutions, they funded them too, right? Including yeah, Malaysia, or the institutions here. Yeah. Every institution yeah. in the world, right? Like uh, have, right? And then a lot of them, like the Malaysian ones, also fund locally as yeah. well. So we need to see this in balance, right? Uh, and, but however, I'm, what, what I'm lamenting on is that my first point of this, this argument is that we're existing in this place and time that, we, that us as nations and then later as people and companies, we need to learn these new levels, right? So uh, no, second thing I'm saying is that they're racing ahead. They're winning this game. So should the next hundred years, should all of us still be developing nations? Should all of us still be like sitting in the bystandings? Or is this a time where another 20 or 30 companies, uh, countries can come together and start doing business with each other and start transferring knowledge to each other, st start collaborating with one another, start organizing with one another and start co-investing in one another so that all of us can rise. 
So uh, I've concluded a nine-month research project within my firm, right, where we looked into um, a lot of economic macro indices, um, and we've surfaced like 30 countries we call the Rise Nations, which are non-market leader countries, right? And lo and behold, Malaysia's in them as a Rise Top 30. Uh, Malaysia's in it, uh, a lot of Southeast Asian countries, Indonesia, then a lot of Asian countries like India, and so on and so forth are uh, in it. Um, and, and we've identified like how much how far are they away from a GDP standpoint to have uh, venture capital and, and new economy as, as a relevant part of it? And how much more investment does it need to make? It's something like SDGs, you know, where you, what is the SDG, the, the, the funding gap, right? The funding gap for climate change, right? We say, what's the funding gap for new economy? We've managed to spell that out as well. And we've peer reviewed it with a bunch of economists, right? It is, it is a good body of work we're launching in October. This is because like, again, I'm, as VC, I need to quantify, right? I need to fin financialize some of these ideas, right? So, I think that if challenger nations are to rise, that is like the duty right now to do it. And for me, like through my actions and through the actions of our firm, it's like we have been investing in a lot of these challenger nations for so many years. Our investors used to ask us, why are you investing in Malaysia? Like, where are the unicorns? Like, they never had any unicorns. Indonesia never had any unicorns. You, oh, Indonesia, no, no credit card penetration. Smartphone also penetration is so low. I mean, that's 10 years ago. Lah. Our first 50 investments, we have six companies worth more than a billion dollars. Grab, Carson, Bukalapa, you know, uh, Carousel, um, uh, Finexcel, you know, uh, eFishery and so on and so forth, right? It's like we have invested believing that these challenger nations have the capacity to do it. Okay, so that's my first kind of thing, the first observation, right, on national level. Challenger nations own their own tech stack. They need to start investing in their own entrepreneurs, start investing in their own VCs, start investing in their own technology infrastructure and stop selling our tech assets away to other folks. Okay, I'll give you some very scary stats about Malaysia, okay? Good news, we have the highest internet penetration in all of Southeast Asia. Don't ask me why that stat is above Singapore, but it is, okay? Like, you can Google it yourself. Uh, but nothing too much to be proud of. Number two, we have the highest, second highest GDP per capita. Number three, and that's after Singapore. Number three is that we have the third highest amounts of startups, like, in terms of quantity of startups. So it's not too shabby, right? But the bad news at the peak of global tech investment in venture capital 2021, Malaysia, as part of Southeast Asia, only received 6% of venture capital. Number two, 2022, right? The number of VC deals in, South, in, in Malaysia relative to Southeast Asia, we are second last, only surpassing Thailand by a little bit. Even the Philippines had more, right? So why is it we have all the raw ingredients, but we actually do not have the results? I am not particularly like crapping on anything right now, but what my observation is, is that again, we are on this certain timestamp and we play 2X the YouTube speed or whatever. Mm. Like there are things that we need to do to play catch up, right? And so that's really what the Rise Report is about. And it's really a lot of like uh, uh, the, the work that we, we need to do, right? Okay, so I'm done. I, I want to conclude my first point on this just on just like globally is that we challenger nations. We're going to have to invest in our own tech stack. We have to own our own tech stack, invest in our own entrepreneurs, invest, invest in our own venture capital, capital markets. We have to start to wake up Bursa again. We've got to wake up our own local capital markets because we can't have our best companies all listing in the US. Then our Malaysians who want to like own a piece of this so-and-so company, they have to trade in US dollars. No, we cannot have that, right? Japan's done a pretty decent job with their stock exchange because their stock exchange, like a lot of local entrepreneurs can list, you get a lot of liquidity, yeah. capital markets work, right? So, I mean, I, I was just like uh, meeting with some folks over here at, at Bursa the other week as well. I said, look, I told them, I said, look, we've got to collaborate, man. It's like, we gotta we got to start working together as like uh, one capital market, private and public. Like our new office, which I can take you to see is right opposite this building. We chose a Bank Nagara building to have office in. So why is the venture capitalist doing it in a Bank Nagara building, right? In fact, they didn't even know. Yeah, I'll tell that story later, <laughs> right? But it's like it's like it's it's like it's our job as VCs to start collaborating with the rest of the capital markets so we can work together to really ignite things. Okay, that's the first piece of it. Um, the second thing that I've seen with all this, at least in my observations and the work of all of this, right, is maybe that of a, um, maybe that of a. Okay, maybe I'll phrase it this way: the the idea that when we talk about building nations, most of us will think about a developmental model that governments have to do something, right? We talk about, oh, how do we build a better Malaysia? Oh, you know, like prime minister should do this. Oh, um, Malaysia not do that. Ah, the crop politicians, you know, whatever. Like this, like, it's like somebody else's job to build a nation. Mm, mm. Do we have an economic model that everyday Malaysians can actually build the nation? Have we ever asked ourselves, like, what, 
can we do to build a nation? Ah, uh, JFK said that. Right? Ask not what your country can do for you, right? Okay, I, I, I mean that statement is quite clear. That itself, statement, right? that statement is, that, that, uh, yeah, that that's definitely a statement. But I've, that, and and I think that to build on the statement, to give a model. So I'd like to share with you my model, right, <laughs> <laughs> of citizen nation building. Right? <laughs> citizen nation building. Okay, right. Bring so, it on, remember. Okay, okay. So it's very simple, right? Most people, and I'll bring you back to identity. So I told you about sentence. Okay. Our identities, whether you're a foodie, yeah. for the most part, a lot of identities, we could subconsciously be just a consumer. That means our existence is to consume more. Now, if your primary question, if I were to bring Tony Robbins, is what am I going to buy next? Like, you know you're actually a consumer. So we talked about this earlier. A nation of consumers is a nation of prisoners, a nation of slaves. That's consumption, right? And you're going to need some healthy domestic consumption, but don't let me get into that. But I'm just saying that, okay, too many consumers, it's a problem. Yeah. But it's a necess- it's a necessity. You need enough consumers as well. Okay, then we move on to the next identity. You're a worker. So what do you mean by a worker? So as a child, maybe like, ah, mommy, daddy, can you buy me this or not? Okay, you're a consumer, right? Now you're a worker. You say, okay, I'm going to earn my own money, right? You're willing to do any kind of jobs. You can wear a blue collar, gig worker, white collar. You're getting this paycheck. You're, just, you're really trying to make money, right? So your primary question shifts from what do I want to buy to how can I make more money? Everywhere you go. Early 20s, a lot of people, hey, how do I get more salary? So that's that second one. Okay, so from a consumer to a worker, now we go to the third one. How can I build a business? Now, this is a question that's not always asked, but of course, in entrepreneurial realms, you're like, oh, yeah, that person's business is very good. Oh, you look at this tea live, oh, they're Brian Lua, uh, raking, uh, you know, like, do, 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 everything. Or this uh, village park, Nasi Lemak, then you're thinking, you know. Like, hey, should I start a nasi lemak shop or not? Right? You're thinking, you know, hey, you know, uh, the auntie uh, on the plus highway, uh, sell, the, sell the curry pub, you know how much money she make or not? Uh, you know what I mean? So it's like, your, so this is like, how do I, how do I make, uh, from, from the, how do I, how do I make money, make more money, to how do I build a business? That's very different. Because when you build a business, you're forced to employ people most of yeah, the time. Yeah. Right? So, uh, otherwise you're self-employed, but you know, then you're forced to employ people and so on and so forth. So now you move to the third, identity as a nation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move to the fourth one, right? Now, once you build, uh, uh, as, as a, how do I build a business? You're, let's say, how do I invest my money? Okay, so the fourth primary question is that your role, your identity is become an investor. Yeah. So you simultaneously can be in all identities, but if your primary question every day is that you made some money already, then you talk to your friend and say, hey, should I buy Tesla? You know, or something like that. You know what I mean? Like you're thinking, like, oh, what am I going to invest in? Hey, how do you do stocks and bonds? Like, what's your split? You know, like, oh, you, do you invest in this fund or that fund, right? So I, I share this, like, as a citizen model because I saw my dad go through this. Growing up as a child, like, I'm listening to his conversations, right? I think mm. kids are smart, right? Like, you know what I mean? I'm listening to what he's talking about. Firstly, he's starting about to buy, right? Because we had jack shit in our household, right? Like, his first house, he had like a, uh, like a like that round, be- it's not a beanbag, like, but it's this round thing that looks like a, I, I know, looks like a moon cake. It's a sitting thing. Yeah, right? it's like yeah. a giant moon cake, right? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. his living room so far, right? Then <laughs> Every after- house in Malaysia had one. <laughs> exactly, right? Who made a good money on that one? But, you know, so it's like the, so he, he started buying more things. He's like, oh, what's the next thing to buy, right? And he then became upgrader, like a lot of folks. And he's like, upgrade car or whatever it is as he succeeded in his professional career. So it's like, I seen him like, go through from buying things, you know, and he wanted to be an entrepreneur too. He started a business and he did not succeed. He started a landscaping business. He employed people, you know, because he was doing all this kind of like waterfall made of cement type thing, you know what I mean? And it didn't work out for whatever reasons, right? So I've seen him kind of like go to... Then after that, like he worked in this company, an oil and gas company that went public. And I saw the effects of the public markets and how it actually can change lives. Like we went from a household which was like really, really skimping to once the company went public, the shares were worth something. And then suddenly like he had to think like, what do I invest in? Then suddenly his cousin reminder popped out of nowhere. You know what I mean? The yeah, stock broker, yeah. you know what I mean? So you know, I think this conversation on how do, what do I invest in? Okay. So we want to the fourth part already. Now that's the last part. And I don't think many Malaysians, but I think a lot of Malaysians as well, they actually get into this last part. Is that how do I become a nation builder? They may not really think of themselves as nation builders, but if they're contributing to charity or the community or involving volunteering, even in political parties and other things and whatnot, but they are doing something that outside of these four realms, they're actually contributing to the nation in some yeah. sense, right? Yeah. Okay, so national independence. We just celebrated independence, right? As Merdeka, right? Are you Merdeka, right? If you're an independent nation, for the most part, independent, thriving nations have enough people who are on the right side of things, where they're nation builders, smart people going into politics, smart, honest, high integrity people in politics, but a lot of people building social organizations, creating a lot of impact, foundations, charity, a lot of social protection that goes beyond governmental social protection that strong. Then when you talk about like uh, uh, people who are investing, you've got a big investment community, right? The local capital markets, angel investment, you know, private investing, venture capital, that stuff is strong. Then when we talk about the um, 
was that building business, you've got enough SMEs, right? And SMEs are founded by entrepreneurs. Most GDPs of most countries, the, the, the percentage that comes from SMEs is about 60 to 80%, even in the US, right? So you need a healthy amount of entrepreneurs to build business. If you've got enough of this, and you've got some consumers and some people who are working, you know, enough people are working, you're all right. You just need like 10 to 20% on the, the, the last three categories. You're good, right? But so many countries, you actually have it the other way around. You have like majority of people who are just consuming, wanting to buy things. And most people are just willing to do some work, but not enough people creating jobs. Not enough people investing or reinvesting in the country, right? They make the money from jobs to go invest somewhere else, right? So it's not, inv- not enough investments. And then lastly, it's not enough people contributing to, uh, to, to, to society as a nation builder. But I'll give you another more extreme example. What if the people who are consumers are actually nation builders? So they're trying to make more money for themselves, but they're in a nation building role. <laughs> That's where you got complete national poverty and enslavement, and you got countries in some other parts of the world, in some other continents, which has been in dire states for decades, because this model is like upside down for them. I'm going to close off this citizen model of development yeah. with a family <laughs> example. If you had five people in a family, one is still a child, like needing support and it's just consuming. One is like doing part time work and just getting some money. The one created a business can bring money back to the family. The fourth person in the family is like helping to manage the family finances so can invest and really protect wealth for the family. Then the last one is like doing charity and helping out. Oh, what a what an awesome family, right? You're really thinking about it. You've got five people in the family. Some are moms, some are dads, sister, brother, That's right? the perfect country, isn't it? Yes, exactly, right? 20%, 20%. Yes, right? yes, 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 yes. But, but at the same time, is that you also have a lot of families out there where nine people are actually mouths to feed. There's only one person working because they're the one like the, the stupid dad like ran away and then never came back or something. That's tough. That's a tough life. And that's the work that my wife does, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? She feeds the homeless. She feeds like B40 families, you know? And then for us, all the money that we've made, right? We have a very, div- very and maybe I get personal about this, right? Like I've, I'm trying to experiment with our lives, right? I'm not trying to say like, oh, I'm so good. I'm a hero of it. Not that. I'm actually very highly experimental. And a lot of things that I do in the way I lead my life, right? Is I don't know whether it's going to work or not. Even my vegan lifestyle, I don't even know like, what, am I going to get some weird disease later? I don't know, right? So I do a lot of health, health, te- health tests and everything, right? But what I mean to say is that a lot of people wait till they're old then they have a story to share. Yeah. They wait till old and say, okay, I'm wise enough, maybe I'll impart some wisdom, right? For me, is that I've been just sharing what's on my mind and I've not ever claimed any of this to be wisdom, right? I'm as lost as you are. I'm just trying to make sense of the world. And, is you, and just like yourself, you are going deep into your own mind and the mind of your, the people you interview because yeah. you try to see how they see the world. That's all. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Right, that's you, you got like 140 people, uh, like very important people as guests, right? Not yeah. any one of them are right about everything all of the time. In fact, all of them are mostly wrong about everything most of the time. But they may be right about one or two things. So for me, I do the same. I just want to look at what my lens is. And if I can share my lens with you and we can have a good discussion about it, then maybe we help each other out, right? So I think that, uh, number one, I think people can talk about their views and try to be constructive and nourishing about it sooner. Number two, it's never too early to do charity. Like, I, I, I am convinced, like, and, and I, I don't want to go into that uh, too deeply, but I am convinced that any form of micro-charity that you do, like, your world would be very, very different. And your relationship with money would be very different. And I got this lesson directly from Richard Branson on Necker Island, right? Like this is you went on Necker Island. Yeah, it's a decade ago for some okay. for some okay. weird. Uh, okay. And this is a part of like the way I lead my life. Okay, you know I'm going to tell you the story. Okay, that's what okay. I'm going to do. See, right? See, then, see, we're, then we're going to come back. Yeah. So I saw a newspaper article uh, on uh, it's digitally, of course, uh, on New York Times about um, Richard Branson having like Tony Blair, Sergey Brin, Larry Page, and you know all the cool people at the time, like right on this island, you know, talking about the world and everything, right? I forwarded the article to my bosses. I was like 22 years old in my job. I forwarded to my the founders of Mind Valley. I said, "Yo, like we gotta be on the island, yo. Like that's where we need to play you just at." Said it just like that, right? Exactly. Yeah, we gotta be there, right? Yeah, you got, we gotta be at that level, right? We we need to be invited to that as a signal that we've done something meaningful and important, right? Or something that's of interest, and we have that level of conversations. I think that's where we need to go. Four years later, I'm on an island with one of my bosses. You're on that island. On the island with Richard Benson. One whole week he's spending time with us, all right? On the island, right? Now, after I came back from that trip, right? I went to my inbox because I knew I sent that email once upon a time. It is the same week four years ago. Fucking hell, man. Same week four years ago I sent that. You've right? got so many examples of this. It's a bit scary, lah. I, I got too many for you, bro. Like, too many. Like, the first, you know, I'm going to tell you one more, right? Just so your RAS is <laughs> damn bloody strong, man. That's what I'm saying. Some people's magnet are damn strong. Some people are not. I, I believe your dreams. like a huge bloody super magnet. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. Because it, you just, all you do is think about it, then fucking happens, right? Come on. Yeah, but, but, but it happens, but all of us have the power, except most people think about bad things. 
most of the things like what could go wrong well, I think about good things they, all the time they don't always <laughs> <laughs> they're happening bro they're happening bro it's, it's happening for you bro it's happening for you but you know there could be other conflicting things as well yeah, right yeah. Then nothing was in my way on getting the island I like zeroed out that, that I would be there at some place yeah? at some point okay, okay. right and, or, and for me it's like it's just a symbol I didn't even need to be an island it's more like can you can you play at a level for me I wanted to play at a level where intellectually and like the work that I do with my life it's it relates and it 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 relates to a lot of people. It touches a lot of people. It, it, it's engaged with a lot of people, you know. But um, okay, so I'll go back to my point. Why I brought up that uh, that uh, that island story. Um, I'm talking about. Sorry, you have to help me backtrack here. The I digress to the island thing. Um, oh, he shared this. Uh, he shared something with me about giving, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I talk about charity. There we go. Micro charity. So he said this. Um, we were talking about charity at that point. The kind of things that he was doing. And he told me that one of the biggest ahas he had later in his life was that it is as interesting and as difficult to give money than to make money. So giving money and the way he's kind of approached philanthropy himself in his own world is, is as interesting as making money. And it's also as kind of like challenging as well. Now, how do you actually do it? So when I kind of took that to heart, I'm like, okay, you know, I didn't feel fully compelled to give money to anything specific. I didn't want to do it for no reason, right? It's like buying something that you didn't like anyway, if yeah. you take a consumption yeah. metaphor. Yeah. But when I saw that, like in Palestine, uh, this was quite many years ago, um, what someone I bumped to at a conference, she was fundraising for power generators. She's from the US and she moved to Palestine to create this thing called Gaza Sky Geeks. And they were fundraising for power generators so entrepreneurs could have consistent power. Oh, wow, so interesting, interesting, moved, interesting. You know, I'm like, yeah. I'm taking it for granted over here. I'm like, oh, my internet is not fast enough. It's like, they may not even have power. Then she was telling me is that some days they have a little accelerator there, the entrepreneurs don't show up. Then they're like, oh my God, the first thing, they must be dead, which is the normal thing to happen. Gonna bomb or whatever. Then suddenly like, nine days later, they show up, everyone's so happy, hugging the guy, oh, where you been? Say, oh, sorry, my house got bombed. We had to rebuild the house. There's different perspectives. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I, I started a fundraising campaign, I put some money down on myself, then I made a pledge thing, and then we, we went for it. This is the first time I ever did charity. And it was interesting. It was really rewarding. And for me, like, it was like, it's just a real journey, right? So as far as charity is concerned, it's like, I wasn't even like super as flush at the time, but I'm, 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 my wife and I, when we got married, we create like a 50 year model in Excel. If we saved up all of our money till we die and that gave it away. That sounds exactly like you, man. I, I got to <laughs> quantify this, man. Like, I'm professionally trained. I got to quantify it. And then we play it with different toggles, inflation, so and so forth, everything, right? And then we said that, yo, um, if we saved up all our money and only when we die, we give it away, how much can we give? versus if we start giving away today at 10%, right? Which, you know, some people use it for tithing or whatever, you know, you can call it what you want. So we just choose 10%. 10% of every dollar in every month, how is it going to look? How much impact can we have, right? Then how much can we save up for ourselves and so on and so forth? Okay, then we change that. What do we give away 30%, right? Then we started playing with the sensitivity of the model and we realized that actually if we keep our costs low enough, Right? And, and I'm not saying that I keep my cost super low. Like that you want to talk to my dad about keeping costs low, you talk to him, right? So for me, it's like, I'm, you know, I, I have my comforts that I indulge in too, right? So I, I, I think I'm, but, but, but generally, is you keep it low enough, right? You can actually move that 10% to 30% to 50% to 90%, and actually, you're still really good. You're still very safe as far as like what is financial safety and security means to you, uh, depending on, again, how you play this model. So everyone can build their model. So again, wife and I, we experiment with that, right? So like we have actually an inordinate amount of money going to uh, Wiki Impact. It's a media company as well that we founded with some people who are formerly from sys.com that focuses just on the nourishing stuff. Just on the nourishing stuff. And um, and it's you can check it out on Instagram and we do research articles. We do like a lot of nourishing things. It has its own cult following as well. So Wiki Impact, um, three years on, the whole team is entirely funded by like the money that I make in my life, right? That And then it will continue to be as such, right? And then they're getting into break even hopefully at some point. My forever doggo, I told you about earlier, right? We're spreading message of kindness as it relates to, 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 to animals, right? So my forever doggo is like doing its thing. Also a full team that is like funded by us. Then um, uh, Kachara Soup Kitchen Society, where my wife is the group uh, managing director of it. They feed 185,000 people a year. Um, every one ringgit that's given to that uh, society results in five ringgit of food given to uh, B40 homeless, all of them audited and, and checked up on. It's like 15 years of integrity, tax exempt. It's just a real institution, right? Now, these three are the primary vehicles that we give right now, whether it's through time and through money, and mostly a combination of both, as well as a lot of other things. This model of charity, I think that if more Malaysians get <coughs> to play with it a little bit, no matter what wealth level they're at, even if it's just like one ringgit a year, that is like actually the start of something that really gets us into a developmental model later on. Okay, so on the note on like uh, micro charity, 
Um, another kind of like function of nation building that because this is a citizen's model like I'm not talking about this in the context of like you have to be rich to actually do these things right because a lot of uh, my forever doggo for example uh, with that with that uh, initiative um, it's not just about like sharing videos about kindness to the dogs but we actually take shelt- photos of shelter dogs and then give them makeovers then people want to adopt them because they look so cute on the algorithm right? yeah, yeah. and then so and that's all volunteer run there's like a 200 of volunteers that go there to take picture of the dogs and edit the photoshop the dogs and also to kind of like help the dog feel calm and happy you know so a lot of things are volunteer driven uh, Kachara Soup Kitchen Society they have um, over a, a volunteer database of 20,000 people and a lot of them actually come from corporates all of them are corporate leaders but a lot of them are, are students you know so it's like everyone can also volunteer time right so I think all these things make a lot of sense I'll share one last bit on this micro charity aspect is that a lot of innovation that goes into business and capitalism, if you just have 10%, 2% of innovation that goes to solving societal problems or maybe creating nation-building kind of community projects, like you're going to see a world change. Because the way, yeah, and I'll give you real examples in Malaysia, right? I really admire the work of Seksan and Dr. Tan Lokman. They're both architects. So in my weekends, I like talk about what I do with my time. Like I spend, I try to spend time with people who are not not specifically in the industry I'm in. And I being a quite like identifying as a my identity level as a creative spirit is I mm. love hanging out with architects. <clears throat> architects function in the built world. I function in the intangible world, right? So they function in creativity in the built world, right? The the physical world. And so for uh, Sixan, uh, he's got the Kebun Kebun Bangsar, right? Which I think some been there, beautiful visit. place, it's beautiful. Yeah, like you think of like just a net contribution to well being yeah. in Klang Valley because of that project. Yeah, and how parents are bringing kids over there. You bring families closer. They got projects to work on. You get animals. It's so beautiful of a project, right? Then you look at Dr. Tan Lokman. He's created this thing in Jalan Bedara behind Changka. It's called the Urban Museum. Then it's Urumu U R dash M U. Ah. Oh. We were supposed yeah. to meet that earlier, right? Yeah, I wanted to go right. hang out there. I think yeah, it's a cool yeah. place to hang. I like to bring people there to hang because yeah. like he's he's made his money as an architect and he's got a lot of art. He's collected a lot of early works of Malaysian artists. Instead of keeping it in his house, he said, right, let's just like turn it into this urban museum and make it very affordable. So anyone can go there and just like peruse it to upkeep the maintenance costs. He only charged like five ringgit, ten ringgit. But he has bus loads of people, even from schools out of state, stopping by a bus to go there and look at the Malaysian artists and stuff like that. And he actually became profitable as well. <laughs> so he started as a... Once you start giving, it starts coming back, right? Yeah. I mean, that's how the universe works, isn't and, it? Yeah, there's like a weird way that it works. And it's, it's, it's got so much demand where other art collectors talk to him and say, yo, can I yeah. display my art in the urban museum as well? I just want to contribute and give back. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's not about just your volunteer hour. It's not just about your one ringgit or one million ringgit that you donated. It. It's about what happens after. It's like that that follow on, that, that, that trickle on effect, right? I'll give you one last story about this, yeah. right? So um, my work brings me to San Francisco, Palo Alto, Silicon Valley a lot. <clears throat> and uh, and because I go there so much, and back then before my wife took on this job, like uh, she traveled with me, um, and every time we were there, I spent say a few a few weeks over there, and then she would volunteer, find organization to volunteer at. So she volunteered at this one uh, very very small startup, right? Which is not startup; it's like nonprofit. It's called Code Tenderloin. Cool, cool Code name. Tenderloin. So, so for, for, for those who are familiar with San Francisco, Tenderloin is where most of the homeless people live, and um, Tenderloin is ironically just across Market Street to the financial center of San Francisco, right? And a lot of startups and a lot of big companies. Salesforce Tower, you know, it's all there, right across the same street, right? So you got like the epicenter of homelessness and the tech capital over <laughs> there just across one street, right? Yeah. So one gentleman there called Dal Simon, he's been uh he's been a resident of Tenderloin as a drug user and so on and so forth for 16 years. He's just living in the streets. He had his own epiphany moment. He woke up and says, Hey, I'm just gonna get people like us here jobs across the street. Right? So cool. <laughs> right? So so, cool. And that's the only way that this yeah. city is going to work. Yeah. So he, then he recruited his staff members, who are also homeless people. So the team that we met and the team that my wife worked with were three homeless people trying to get more homeless people jobs in tech firms. Yeah. So they went to knock on doors of tech firms to say, can you come and mentor and, and help our homeless people CV, brush things up a bit and get them jobs, right? Yeah. And they were successful. You know, you got <coughs> folks started off very junior at LinkedIn, data entry, became programmer at LinkedIn. Yeah, those folks make a lot of money, man. And so and so forth, right? So um, we said that, hey, this is a beautiful program, right? Uh, and we're not like the biggest philanthropists out there. There are tons of amazing philanthropists in Malaysia as well that I really admire, like Brahma and Shanti, you know, from Creator Foundation and so, and so forth. They do great work. But so we said, look, we can't give a lot of money, but we're going to give this amount of money. 
and it was my birthday at the time. So I said, okay, so this is like a challenge letter I wrote. We're gonna give X amount of money. And we think that bridging, uh, bridging the tech world and the rest of society is important work. And I'm not even from San Francisco. <laughs> it's crazy, right? You know, I, I'm a beneficiary of like the tech yeah. boom, yeah. but I'm not even from <clears throat> San Francisco. And I'm challenging the local American and San Francisco people to donate the same amount of money that I donated as an outsider to this organization because they're doing the kind of work that needs to be done. They're, they're kind of like rounding out the negative externalities from the tech boom. Like you gotta, for yeah. your birthday, do this, yeah. right? Yeah. First off, I did not know like the the, the, the team of three homeless people, they all broke down and cried. It's the biggest check they ever received. I'm no. telling you, it is not a big check, okay? Wow. It's the biggest check single donation they ever received. Number two is that they went door-to-door -door printed version of this letter. They got like the founder of Zendesk to donate and match the same amount for his birthday. And that dude is also not from San Francisco as well. He's not an American. You know what I mean? So, so you got a lot of these like other people who are beneficiaries of tech boom putting money in. And I was most, and this may, may or may not be overly related to the let letter or not, Jack Dorsey of Square, he donated a million US dollars when he kind of got word of this. Bam, wow. spent a million bucks. So it's just one Doppler effect, the one ripple, then it just goes whoosh, Exactly. Right? And the Jack Dorsey thing <coughs> is, of course, a huge endorsement. And that is, of course, the biggest single check he got from an individual. So because you started this. I wouldn't say directly oh. because, but oh. I'm saying that there is... A, it started this ripple effect. Because the work, the what caused this because of the good work they do, right? But I'm just saying that little things you do have these kind of ripple effects. So just like when you create a business and do jobs and stuff, like the same thing with charity and, and giving back to society. So I feel like it's like an area that I want to do more in, I want to play with, you know, and, and like for my wife and I, we, we spend a lot of time on, but and, and to bring innovativeness to that as well, which is why Wiki Impact that you can check out on Instagram or wikiimpact.com or my friend Doggo, like they are, they are innovations, right? And you yeah. look at uh, Urmu by Ta 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 Dr. Tan Lokman or you, you see like, uh, uh, what's that? The, the Kebun Kebun Bangsa by Sixan and the other kind of Kongsi KL and other things that these architects have contributed to, they've gone the citizen model of national development. They're nation builders and they're not politicians per se, right? They're yeah, not. In yeah, fact, they're, they're yeah. far from it, right? But they are nation builders in their own way. So all the uncle, uncle, like yeah, I, tell, I thought of my dad as well. I'm like, yo, like you've retired already. And then you're managing these properties and then you're like so happy you're getting like 4% yield from your renting of your property because FD is like 3% or whatever. Yeah. What are you going to do with that money when you die, man? Yeah. You know, and and like, I, you, know, you don't need to give it to any of us. Like as, as children, like all of us, we've, we've made our own, you know, and we've, we've, we've hustled because of the hard work that you put in, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't feel the need that you can take care of us. There are other people that you can take care of too. So we brought him to Kudat, Sarawak, right? Where the, the, you know, for his family holiday, I said, look, let's just bring my parents to Kudat, Sarawak, where the poorest people live. We, then we work with some volunteer organizations there and just like expose them a little bit. They bought a truck for them, you know what I mean? So I'm trying to like encourage a little bit of this activity. Yeah. And I think this activity is beautiful because actually a lot of retired folks actually do come together in charitable organizations, Rotary Club, Soroptimist, you know, and whatnot, and they do these projects. It's beautiful, dude. Okay, why I talk so much at length in this podcast about this is because a lot of the time you talk about nation building and you point at somebody else, you disempower yourself. Yeah. There's so much we can do as citizens. Yeah. Right? You want to do more, right? Like we can do more. We're yeah. not asking other people yeah. to do more. Yeah. Okay, I'll show you one last thing about this ESG yeah. thing. It's yeah. a real pet peeve of mine, right? Yeah. A lot of folks, oh, ESG standards, da, 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 da. I think it's all good. Within my firm, we had this discussion and then like some folks were like, hey, our ESG policy, you know, we need to do more on climate, da, 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 da. I said, okay, let's, let's talk about that. But what's your ESG policy? Yeah. What's your personal ESG yeah. policy, right? What are you doing for the environment? What do you think is social? What kind of governance do you impose on yourself and things you do, right? Let's talk about it. I'm not holding you to whatever standard. I'm saying that we need to talk about this on a personal level. Like, are you recycling? Like, you're asking your company to do all this carbon credit offset, anything like you offsetting your own personal carbon credit offset? Are you are you recycling your own stuff? Like, are you decreasing meat consumption? Are you, have you watched a documentary about this? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I, I think that that if we can get personal about change, be the change you want to see or anything as this, but you really play with it, yeah. your life is multi-dimensional. Yeah. Your life has so much texture and so much color and you're going to get so much energy, right? From having this newness, right? And then that cellular integrity that I talk about where like your actions and your words and everything you do is like a straight line, a straight path. Mm. then life starts working for you and, and things have less friction, right? Because that alignment is so strong. So for me, it's like I just wish people, more people can, can, I wish this for them, you know, that they can experience the same things at least one day a year on mm. some days. Mm. That, that is enough. You don't need to do it every day, all the years, right? But this taste of it is a beautiful taste, man. Yeah, yours is very accelerated because you're very young and you've come to all these quite um, 
uh, erudite conclusions about about life and, and about... I mean, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You've really reached the... I mean, you're very near the peak in terms of your purpose, your ikigai, whatever you want to call it, right? A lot of people spend many decades getting to that point. You're very young and you've gotten to that point. I mean, the fact, <clears throat> the fact that I'm, I'm someone who's many more years older than you, I started this podcast not with the commercial elements in mind. I wanted to give back, right? This is my personal ESG, mm. right? I want you to describe... Uh, in your words, like, how, what is mm. the significance at a cerebral level about um, about giving? Because like Branson said, like, it's almost as hard to give as it is to make, right? And, and also as interesting. As interesting, yeah. correct. And it's very rewarding in many, many layers, right? Yeah, right. Um, and tied back to your original um, <coughs> remark about how in this thin sliver of time, um, the dominant force in, in the world in terms of the energy and the efforts and the focus is the capital is the is the capitalism side of it, right? And, and intangible, right? In, like the intangible, intangibility right? of the Correct. world. Yeah. But it's quite clear because people have been talking about it and they've been labeling the fourth turning or whatever they want to yeah. label it, right? Yeah. Things are changing ever so imperceptibly, but they are changing. People are becoming more conscious, people are becoming more enlightened in some sense. So talk about those two quite related areas, I think. Well, thanks for inviting <coughs> me. And first off, thanks for your kind words. You know, and yeah. I know in the bathroom earlier we we chatted a little bit about this as well, right? Like I, I, I think that everyone at any age has their own wisdom. I think some people have kids. You know, they have these like great and I think conversation with the kids sometimes going to say like the most innocent but profound things. Yeah. So I I think it's I think everyone can give themselves credit for coming up with their own mental models, and a lot of the mental models and a lot of the ways I look at the world comes from a place of pain. Right, comes from a place of like introspection and willing to follow those rabbit holes, not just the YouTube rabbit holes where you go one video to another, but it's the YouTube videos, the movies in your head, yeah. right? That you replay and then you just go back, go back, and then you just stalk it, you audit it, right? You just stalk your own thoughts and then you just come up with a way to pacify yourself so that that you think that okay, this is how I can contain the beast. This is how I can <laughs> this is how I can operate. You're giving yourself a simplistic, reductionistic operating model. Yeah. So even like the my model, my citizen model of like national development is I wanna take the power back. Like the internet has brought forth like people power in a sense. The real P2P is peer to peer, yeah, right? And the yeah. peer to peer technology is not limited to just uh, uh, downloading pirated movies or whatever, right? It's peer to peer is like, it's when we can help each other, we can really combine and connect with each other. And I think that the to, to really think about things, take time to step back and think about things and come yeah. up with easy models to operate in an adaptive way, you know, stalk your dysfunctions and then like, and, 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 and play with it a little and then adapt and play with that a little right so that's kind of like at least the way i've operated right so i appreciate you sharing that you know that that you know like those kind of words but um i think i'm just as lost as anybody else and then all of us are just finding ways to find our own way right okay now to your question about um at this level of time what's next right yeah, like exactly people talk about the future they say oh the future ai robotics right and it, because when people ask about the future they think about technology but what's the future of religion if you talk about, say, in the U.S., I read this really beautiful book, A um, uh, 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 Power of Ritual, right? The author um, was trying to study why churches were going bankrupt in the U.S. Like, he, what he'd observed was that the data was like three to 4,000 churches were getting... Um, were, were, I, I'm, not, I'm not Christian. There's a lot anything, of disdain but, for religion right now. Uh, yeah, so it's like the... So basically, it's like he's just like the P&L of it as well, right? Yeah. Like, and, then, and where are people finding spirituality, right? So yeah. for me, it's like I'm not, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about religion per se, but what I'm saying is that like in that book, what really triggered my mind was that like people are finding religion and spirituality in CrossFit. Yeah. Right, they go to these crossfit yeah. boxes. They go to spin classes. Soul cycle for the soul. <laughs> cycle for the soul. Right. So it's like the, you know, it's like they're, they're finding religion on Reddit threads. They're finding yeah. religion in Discord, you know, uh, 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 channels. Right. They're yeah. finding religion in a web tree project, or maybe like being part of a K-pop fan club per se, and yeah, having yeah. fandom. Right. Yeah. Having a religious fervor for your favorite celebrity. Right. You know what I mean? And, and sports teams. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I think that some of the then you, you ask you like, hey, that's not religious. Come on, man. Like you know, following. But it, it actually is a, a degree of transcendence. Mm. When you when you kind of think about something beyond yourself, you're part of like a collective experience. I talked about it earlier with the mirror neurons, right? You're yeah. part of a collective. That's a, that's a transcendental experience without the need of psychedelics, right? Yeah. You're, you're, that's transcendental in some yeah. sense. Yeah. Where you get out of your own vortex into, you know, something like yeah. how you and I, we have a shared space right now, right? Yeah, so yeah. this is like mildly transcendental and then like we can go to, a, you know, okay. Yeah. But anyways, the point is, you ask about the future and it's important for VCs like, 
and curious minds and creative people to try to envision what it might be. And we're not going to predict it first, right? Because the process is that you want to di- have a divergent thought process first to say, hey, what is within the realm of possibility? Mm. And then, so my thought process is as follows. You can have the hyper-optimistic op- thing on the far right, and then you can have the hyper-dismal Armageddon on the far left. Now, if things are going really, really well, you got universal basic income, you know, these robots will do all the work, algorithms do all the work, and then like, and then machines will do all the work, right? You invest all the machinery and algorithms, and then everybody just like, has like free income all the time, right? So it's UBI, right? Maybe on the far left, you got this really distorted black mirror type stuff that is already happening to somewhat. We talked earlier about like, um, augmenting our face, our faces with buy now, pay later. Right? If we are funding plastic surgery in some schools or whatever it is, like we can take pockets of these things that, that, that things are very perverse. We can talk about how, I'll give you some more crazy examples, right? Like uh, um, one of my founders, like he, was, he visited a business in Indonesia. It's a live streaming, live sales, uh, live selling type farm. So it's like a sweatshop where yeah. they just have these like booths and then like people are in this booth, massive factory. You talk about like over 100 people plus, right? And then they're selling stuff. And the business owner who was operating that live selling farm found out that it's it's more expensive to hire good looking people. So he put an algorithm, like those kind of photo filters that augments your face, makes your eyes bigger, make your face slimmer, and yeah. <laughs> so people who are less good looking can be employed at cheaper rates, and the algorithm made them more good looking and they can sell more on live selling. Wow, that's insane, man. Okay, so you take these yeah. pockets, right, which scares people. Yeah. Like, ah, where's this hidden? Right? It's like it's <laughs> you know, you can take <laughs> <laughs> you, you can take pockets of this and say, hey, on a far extreme, all of us, we have a generation of ADHD, hyper TikTok people with like like nanosecond attention spans and we're all buzzed, right? All of us are just like high and just crack cocaine and kids are just like, <laughs> right? You know what I mean? Like, you, know, you, get, you, know, you, get, you, get, you can take that position, right? You can take that position, right? And then, or you can take the other position where we're all and like doing spirituality and helping each other. Everyone's kind and, and benevolent because we have we've Maslowed all the way up, and that we've uh, we've no longer feel the need for survival anymore. And then we're there to give. You know, you can you can paint these scenarios when you think about the future. Yeah, yeah. And then you can talk about technology. Then you can talk about the role of entrepreneurs. You can talk about um, you can talk about like the steps that people are taking now and you can game theory some of these things and then you can accept that in some countries if why i care about challenger nations as a concept is because i do not believe that if you got one or two large superpowers dictating the rules of the world that like things will be better for all of us you know i believe that you need a bit of check and balance but not too much until you have too much conflict right but you do need some involvement and participation right so that's kind of like how I look at these two extreme scenarios and say, look, can we get people more towards the, you know? And I don't see it as universal basic income because I also don't believe that everyone getting a steady stream of income is going to make you fundamentally happy or more productive. Look at the dole in the UK. Right? Yes. Not great. I yeah. think that there's a lot of ways that it can be better. I mean, like, a lot of things that it advances. Things. You take steps forwards, but it's not the complete set of steps, I guess mm-hmm. is what I'm saying, right? So I'm not anti it either. I just think that there are more steps that need to be taken. What I actually am for is a different kind of UBI. It's not a sweet potato. It's a universal basic innovation. So what that means is that anyone has the ability to advance their own position and to innovate and to create to create companies, to create things. Web3 actually gave that promise, but I knew they weren't going to be able to deliver on it, right? So hence, like, we've, we've kind of hedged a lot of our investments in that space. Like, however, it's like the promise of the internet was that now, every, remember back then, it's like, well, bloggers, oh my God, bloggers. Now everyone can write and publish because once upon a time, you had to be a journalist mm. attached to a news mm. company mm. Mm. to be able to express thoughts. And journalists had so much power because they are the deciders of what editors of newspaper use so much power because you're deciding what society needs to think about, right? Then suddenly, oh, now everyone can write. Everyone's scared. Oh, what's going to be? Everyone's got all these <laughs> stupid opinions, everything, right? Left wing, right wing, everything, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. because you see, that that's the UBI that I want to see. I want to see univer- universal basic innovation where people can adapt. I talked about adaptation, right? Like it is, if everyone has the power to adapt in some ways, then I feel like we, as a whole, we are participating, sometimes with a bit of conflict, but for the most part, a lot of collaboration. And then we can steer between the two extremes into the future very, very well. Okay, last thing I'll say since you brought spirituality, right? And how we are like, you know. I spoke about 
the intangible sliver in time over here where we're trying to find levers to navigate um, the intangible nature, the intangible physics of the new economy and all of economy, software eats the world. But I think that um, we've always actually had a different connection point to intangibility and transcending our own physical body. If you look at the more ancient aborigine tribes and all that, right? Uh, they have ways of connecting, uh, whether it's ayahuasca, <laughs> right? Yeah. And like, just like tripping out on mushrooms yeah. or they have other kind of religious rituals. Well, they see many more dimensions than us, that's for sure. Exactly. So they're tapping into different dimensions, right? Yeah. You take like old Hindu and old and, and ancient kind of like Buddhist, yeah. tantric practices, you, you kind of trace that back as well and you see that every culture I have this like copy of uh, National Geographic it has all the ancient sites yeah. and they talk about the ancient rituals in all the ancient sites and it's a very beautiful issue of National Geographic it's a special and I, I, I like it a lot because it just reminds us of the shared human experience we've had mm. a few thousand years ago mm. that all of us were also trying to transcend yeah. right and then let's say you talk about Stoics right let's, say you take, let's just tra like travel to Greece or whatever the Roman Empire where, you know you look at that part of the world is that like Marcus Aurelius or whatever he's like an emperor he's like a king he's kind of his Maslow at the top and you spend a lot of time with his reflections on Stoicism and then you look at wait a minute Stoicism and Buddhism is like it's, it's so much in common right and it's like it, they are also trying to transcend they're also trying to find that connectedness they didn't have the internet so I think as far as intangible and transcending our physical environment is concerned, spiritual practices, just going within yourself and just connecting with other people. Um, I, I'm really interested in dreams. I think that uh, in a, maybe a later part of my life, I want to spend a lot of like uh, uh, funding on researching dreams because I think like um, the dream world that we have when we go to bed is like, we spend so much time on it, but there's very little that we understand of it. You can go into outer space and shoot rockets out of space or the deepest of oceans, but the deepest ocean in outer space in here, there's like an infinite, there's an infinity absolutely. in there, right? And so to the extent that we can understand dreams and understand like its role, its function, how do we have like adapt adaptation that relates to dreams? Is it very useful? Or is it just a blank hole of us just like, just like detoxing every night? You know what I mean? And there's nothing more to it, right? I don't know. Right? Yeah, okay. So it just seems to me that- Yeah, but, but I should just close at the point. Yeah, okay. The point the point I have is just, it's, it's, it's about, you asked me about the future, and in the future and how we actually have a rudder and a steering to like the different scenarios of a dystopian future or utopian future and how we rudder towards it. Uh, and then we talk about um, spirituality and transcendence and like being part of a whole and going beyond ourselves. I, I, I and pardon, I had to cut, uh, you know, like I, I'm, I'm trying to conclude this as well is that there's an enemy of the future. There are actually real obstacles to getting ourselves to even step forward in the future, whether as a country in Malaysia or whether any challenger nation to actually take steps into the future. And there's also a lot of obstacles of us personally adapting ourselves to actually be better versions of ourselves, right? And I think we touched upon it a lot during this podcast. Now, identifying what these enemies are important. They're obstacles that you've got to crush and break through, right? To be able to take those steps. And I have one mega message that I want to share. And it's really, I'm trying to live my life to prove this point. That there's a disease that we have all adopted as part of the perpetuating algorithm of the post-industrialized, I call it a post-industrial algorithm. Now, what is the post-industrial algorithm? It's very Henry Ford, where it's a lot of specialization, where, where we talk about industrialization, right? Like, okay, you are bricklayer, and then I'm the person who makes the cement, right? Then we have like, say, Frederick Taylor, like scientific uh, theory of management, right? Like everyone has a specialist role, right? So I, I mix the cement, you lay the bricks, that's thing, our construction company is so efficient, right? Rather than me running to do the breaks and then to do this, to do that, and you know, me one leg kick everything. This suddenly we, <laughs> so, so we, we perpetuated a lot of the idea of specialization and the gains of specialization into society where someone can be trained as an as a, as a actual science auditor or accountant for like 50 years. And then they, they're like the one trick pony that has like a certain set of skills and, and they identify with it. And then that, that's beautiful because it, but it also has risks. You introduce a lot of fragility if people can't really play multiple roles. Yeah. If you've got a sports team and then everyone only has one role to play, then when someone's injured, can that person step into the other role if you've got nobody else on the bench, right? Then COVID happens, some people are displaced, they've been in the same job for 20 years, then they, they suddenly don't have their job to do. Then oh, what do I do, right? So it's like that 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 lack of flexibility and and is because of that 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 specialization. Now this specialization, right, like the obstacle of adapting to the future is we become inflexible because of this repeated training in one sport only, or one professional training only. So the antidote to this is also comes from my pain of trying to fit into or rather try to adapt with a specialized society. Now I have a lot of interests growing up, a lot of variety of interests. 
like dabble in many things and then like i remember like this who it was right and again like people put things in your head and then you're like who said that you can't remember jack of all trades master of none i was like okay that's kind of like very catchy the way that alliterates is like a good spoken word but what does that mean that means like must i master something that does that sub if you accept that to be true or you accept that to be have wisdom in that does that mean that you're meant to master one thing at least have one thing right so now that's again this is the post-industrial complex right this yeah. post-industrial algorithm that says that all of us are a product and i'm not even talking about the internet now instagram algorithms tiktok algorithms facebook algorithms that like you name it like even like google's search algorithms they reward productization of you mm-hmm. So if you're known as the media guy and you're like, I'm the media guy, I'm the media guy, and then like, okay, then people know how to find you because you're the media guy, right? So society has productized you, you've productized accordingly because you're part of this, you know? And so hence, like if we continue to have societies churning out uh, people who study, people who go to work and, and just get pushed out as products and one trick ponies, we're not gonna be able to steer very well into this very complex future that we're headed into. And the antidote to that is what I call the full stack human. How do you be, and this is a new term for renaissance, right? Because once yeah. upon a time, yeah, yeah. renaissance was normal. Correct. Right? You have apprenticeship as a blacksmith, <coughs> as this, as that. Leonardo da Vinci, yeah, he painted Mona Lisa, but he also drew cadavers. He also and like- he was an engineer and he was a designer. Yeah, as well, he drew right? early right. prototypes for helicopters Correct. and all that, right? So if you look at Buckminster Fuller, right? I think Penang has a Bucky Fuller. Huge, thing. huge fan base in Penang. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm a massive fan of Bucky Fuller. I've like consumed a lot of his lectures and videos on YouTube, you know, and I just think he's like super genius. You know, he came from a place of pain as well to, you know, he, 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 he had a lot of loss in his life and then when he came out of it he just had a lot of time to think and then he says hey i'm just going to go around the world and lecture about spaceship earth right and how do we like using if earth was a spaceship how are we using its resources in an efficient way then he built the dimac the dimaction car like he built the uh geo uh what's that the the, the geodesic dome the geodesic Kunta, dome yeah, yeah the yeah. geodesic dome is the only architectural structure that gets stronger the bigger it gets huge right yeah so you can you can scale it up it's like it's like scalability right so people so I, so the, the whole idea of like being a renaissance person in this age, I put the renaissance thing inside because it sounds like, oh my God, I gotta be a Leonardo da Vinci. No, <laughs> we're talking about whole brain theory. I'll give you more words yeah, to describe yeah, the yeah. same thing, right? Whole brain theory, right? If you think that if you only exercise one side of your brain for 50 years, you're going to be like, you, like you talk about like dementia, you talk about Parkinson's, you talk yeah, about these things, yeah. right? You talk about parts of your brain that go dead because of 50 years, no blood cell, no electricity has traveled to the other part of the brain. Yeah. Right? I'm mean, dramatizing over here, but you know, as far as whole brain is concerned, like we talk about your food diet, what's your brain yeah. diet? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What have you been, what parts of your brain has been activated? When was the last time, like let's say we talk about people spend no time in nature at all. Right? And let's, let's talk about like when my grandmother was like 90s and she was, uh, she was dying, what, what a relief she got from petting a dog. Right, you think about it's what insane, electricity, right? yeah. yeah, what electricity goes to which parts of the brain to wake different parts up. Like the activities we do, the people we spend time with, the type of conversations we have, the things we do outside of our personal professions and within our personal professions, all that consists of a kind of like a brain activation diet. So by lighting up only one part, it's like you just work out your left hand only. Or like, I only just do legs day every day and I just look like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? Like I'm talking about, <laughs> like if we have a full body workout, we do endurance training, we do weight training, how about your brain? We can do all kinds of emotional training, kind of like intellectual neocortex stuff. The post-industrial complex and the disease is that we have overemphasis on our neocortex of intellectualizing and storytelling everything that we're experiencing, right? Yeah. Can we just let emotions be emotions? Right? It's like, can we just allow and accept and not reject some of these things, right? How often have we cried in front of a whole team as a leader, right? You ask my team, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a big proponent of allowing emotions, right? So I've cried a few times, right? And this is not out of sadness or whatever, it's just sometimes I'm inspired and I also can cry. You know what I mean? But the thing is, because I'm trying to lead life by example of like having like um, to be a full stack human. You arrive at work as a full human, you go home as a full human, you don't need to come to work as a product, right? And you say, oh, but wait, I come to work, I'm too emotional and I get fired. I'm like, well, then maybe your workplace isn't like, maybe there's steps towards that, right? So if you come to work as a full stack human, I need to create a place where my team members feel okay to express emotions. And you're not punished for expressing emotions, right? And it's harder with, with a lot of dudes who are people who've grown up with um, families where they're punished for expressing emotions, right? So I don't wanna go, I mean, I have a lot of theory to build out a full stack human. My whole point is, hey, we don't need to, like, it's like trying to be renaissance, whole brain theory, being full stack human, having a lot of different hobbies, doing a lot of different jobs, right? And having this whole idea and identity that you're actually a human. So you are not, it's very fight club, right? You are yeah. not your IKEA furniture. You are not your job title. Yeah. You are not your this XYZ. You're not your LinkedIn profile. You know, you're not any of these things. As a full stack human coming to work, 
you have more options. You can see things from different dimensions. Yeah. You're, not, you're not chained to one identity, yeah. right? And then like when your job, you, you ever lose your job or your company shut down or fail, you hit the reset button, this human's going to find a new thing to do, right? Yeah, go elsewhere and do another thing. Yeah, do another thing. Yeah. Try yeah. something else, right? Yeah, Start yeah. a podcast. You know what I mean? Anything you want, man. <laughs> So the message quite, is quite clear. Stay, cu- stay, stay curious, be resilient, keep learning, learn new skills, right? I want to go back to the whole idea about investing. Investing in the, in the traditional world, until now at least, a lot of it has gone towards the real world, the physical world, right? Yep. Um, servers, internet, whatever, right? Monitors, whatever. So little money has gone into the, to the human psyche. I mean, a little bit has gone. I mean, I want to talk about things like um, Elon Musk's Neuralink, right, for example. Okay. It's only just starting to come into play. Now, the thing is, to become a full-stack human, either you have the own personal motivation to do so, and not everybody has that personal motivation. As you say, there's a lot of obstacles to get there, right? Can the next wave of technology, which is basically the technologization of the mind, accelerate this? Because you've been a Palo Alto, you've seen the kind of money that goes where, right? and the amount of money, uh, the amount of innovation and progress that has gone on in that part of the world, can that be, can that be a real- reality? Okay. Let me um, work with you on that line of query by telling you a very simple story last, that happened to me last night. So I was being driven back from an event by the husband of one of my cl- closest working colleagues. Right, um, to getting married in two, three weeks. You know, young couple. Now, this dude, he grew up in Ipoh, and he only moved to KL for work. And he's really succeeding over here in his work. I asked him, "Would you ever live in Ipoh? Like, just build a career and just live in Ipoh? Like, why do you have to come to KL and stay in KL?" Right? He said that he probably can. His parents lived their entire lives in Ipoh, and so, and so forth. He said the pace of life's a bit slower, but he likes being in KL. He said even when he's in a traffic jam, he feels like, wow, there are like so many cars, there are like so many people doing things. And he feels like the energy of the city is something at his phase of life, that's something that he wants to be a part of, right? So it's a very familiar story, right? When we think about uh, your question about technology and acceleration, is that if you are on Instagram, the, okay, let's start Facebook first, okay? Facebook versus Google. Google, how much, what is the number of kilobytes of information we are receiving a moment on Google? It's very different from YouTube. When YouTube started having more kilobytes per second of information going into us because it's motion picture, right? It's video. Google had to buy YouTube, right? Then we had Facebook. Google couldn't buy Facebook. They couldn't make a deal. Facebook had a lot of information coming through us and it's very new information because it's social information, right? User-generated content over what your mom is doing or your friends are doing and whatnot, right? But then Instagram, came around where it's just pictures only. And then you can scroll, 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 scroll. You can have so much pictures, right? And the picture's so different. It's different from YouTube because YouTube, you have a lot of pictures per second, but it's based on one topic, right? But here you can go to 900 topics in just like literally 15 minutes because you're just like scrolling, right? And then everyone's threatened by TikTok because TikTok, the video is, is like YouTube, but Instagram, it's just like... So my point what I'm trying to make is that like these social platforms and media platforms for the most part are delivering more information per second to feed your brain, they're akin to digital cities. It's akin to like being in Ipo, where you get X amount of stimuli per day, versus being in KL, where you get Y amount of stimuli per day, versus New York, where you get Z amount of stimuli per day. And it's not just about the volume of information, but the variety of information, the uniqueness of angles of information. You know, a city like New York, you got art, you know, uh, you got you got like finance, like, you got a lot of good stuff going on over there, a lot of culture, you know? Then you look at, say, um, Los Angeles. You got entertainment. You got different types of industries, right? So the information and the, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like a real hit to the brain. Yeah. Right? So <clears throat> you talk about Neuralink and all that, right? Connect this to whole brain. Now, as techno- technology will continue to drive towards efficiency, because efficiency, capitalism, business effectiveness, I use the word efficiency because you're actually using less cost to deliver more information, it's kind of like where, uh, where water would flow in nature, where it's got less resistance, then it's going to form the river, right? If water is coming down a mountain, where it's got less resistance, it's going to flow, it's going to form the river. I feel for business and technology, it's very similar. You find the path of least resistance, you build a lot of machinery of efficiency to actually transfer information. So where's this headed? Okay, I got Neuralink. We're already Neuralinked already. It's just that our Neuralink is through our eyes. When I whip this up, I'm already Neuralinking already. It's just that the transfer mechanism is visual. 
Then when uh, Google failed with the first version of Google Lens, it's because like they just, they moved it here, right? <laughs> and it wasn't really like cool, right? And then they are, you know, but I think Apple's take with the Apple Vision, like I think that's actually a better take where you kind of use this, but you overlay on the outside, so you're actually using the HD of that whole environment. I'm like I, I'm like anti metaverse, you know, in a lot of ways because like metaverse is very inefficient and metaverse is not new. I've been building web products since I was 15 years old. I saw Habbo Hotel, I saw the dawn of Second Life, I used IRC, you know, so I can see the efficiency. And then the early versions of metaverse in the past two or three years, they're just like not as efficient in the the long run is there other environments where you got a hololens metaverse the answer is yes but the current versions of metaverse the information transfer is very little anyone who played with any metaverse after you go in there for five minutes you want to teleport already you're like i don't walk around i don't know where am i going who am i talking to it and you just go on this map and try and like teleport somewhere else so anyways my point being is that you have this um uh you asked about like uh the investment in technology as it pertains to Neuralink, link it pertains to like physical world and intangible world and my answer is it is unstoppable it is inevitable just like this torrent of water that finds its own way into a river into an ocean that we will have more and more technology that will have more and more information more varieties of information coming at a faster and faster rate but you have the rudder the moment you lose control of the rudder to switch off the algorithm to go off i mean i was off instagram for about i think almost like three months at one point like just a few months ago detox every now and then right just have a digital detox every now and then so you can rediscover those rudders you can go into dark mode Right again, then you talked about. I mean, I I did mention this to you. Like I used to, at least um, kind of like promote a lot of the venture capital work that I do uh, by being on stage and um, you know. But then I stopped because I went into introspection mode. Like you know, post COVID, you know, there's a lot of things to think about when it comes to these things, right? Yeah. So I feel that as technology <clears throat> continues to have more information transfer, we should not fight it per se. We should use it. We should leverage it. But we should always, always know that the ultimate Com the ultimate defense against AI is our own AI, is our own intelligence versus somebody else's intelligence. The tussle for independence and independent thinking, even for thousands and thousands of years, is whether or not that their propaganda is controlling you or whether or not you can reject it in your own mind. Right? So it's like your intelligence versus my intelligence, right? And then are we choosing to collaborate on something we both can agree with, or am I just like uh, just like agreeing with you because like your algorithms are so strong that you're like feeding me all this thing that I just like totally buy into. So I don't know. Does that help with this topic? Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to, um, in a way, end or, or conclude with with the with the fact that I mean I, I just, I'm just continuously amazed by uh, the conclusions and and um, level that you reached at, the, at this at this age of your life because it's quite clear that you got a long way to go, right? So, so it's a catch-all phrase. What what's in store for you for the next half of your of your life? I mean, what what are you? How are you going to re-architecture your your existence to just leverage on all the learnings you've had in the first half of your life? So, I have a few themes that I'm tackling now. So, I can't say it's going to predict the next fifty years or hundred years or whatnot. But I will say I have a few themes that I feel that will take a lifetime of work and maybe multiple lifetimes of work, right? And through you know. Uh, copious amounts of incarnations forward it is love right sounds cheesy but why did i get married right i was thinking to myself like oh can i actually love some just like one person well in one life that's it because otherwise you got to question the idea of, of of marriage as some single men in their life do and women and and folks we we be like you know is it to copulate and have kids you know but you know there's a lot of functions and expectations around marriage mm. and i think that for me, is that whether you choose to express that through your children or through whatever, is that for me, what is that of loving one human being for one life? And to unpack that is, I've kind of, you know, acceptance, I think is a very big part of that. So what can I accept about somebody else? Like, can I accept everything about somebody else? So I'm not even going to the level of saying, can I love you unconditionally, you know? Can I accept you unconditionally on your worst days and so and so forth, right? So I think that's like a tenet of practice. Now, why is that tenet of practice so integrative to everything that I do? Is because I think sometimes when you have somebody else in front of you, then you can kind of externalize and you can say, well, I'm going to focus on loving this person. But in a lot of ways is that, can I accept all of me? Can I forgive all of me? Can I work with all of me? And can I, um, love and i don't use the word love per se because i think what i'm trying to tackle with is more to do with acceptance right so hence accepting the dysfunctionality and then try to adapt from there right so i think that's one tenet of it because once i 
can practice this within the people who are closest to us and then you can kind of like be like a model human being to the person closest to you, then I feel like you've got integrity. It's like your only ESG policy, right? Then you can go out into the world and say, hey, I'm going to be compassionate or what else, right? Because for, um, so then, so that's like that topic. Then I kind of build it out to the work that I do. Um, I've got this theme that I'm playing with is that I call it the career home. I think for the most part, um, a, a, a common thing that's happened in the past many years is that the baby boomer or whatever you call it is that a lot of our parents have been working a lot and then maybe hence the, the family structure, how much time and attention do kids have? Like, do they feel like it's a safe space? A lot of the family dynamics have gone into work and a lot of work has is, 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 is been influenced by military. And so a lot of military command and conquer organization structures, you know, back then you used to hire people from Westport, you know, and stuff like that to be, you know, like CEOs and things like that, you know, West Point, sorry. West Point, West Point in the US, the military college, right, to be CEOs <laughs> and stuff like that, you know what I mean? So there's like a military com military complex that's gone into work, right? Yeah. So workplaces to me, you can you know, spend most of your productive years and most of your productive hours in a workplace. Is it safe or is it a war zone, right? And then if you come back home and your family dynamic is also a war zone, it's a pretty shitty life, dude. So to me is that I can't fix your relationship issues as an employer, but maybe I can create a workplace that feels like a career home and a place that you don't feel you need to jump left, right, just to increase your pay and so on and so forth. You can choose your own adventure, choose your own speed. You can have a tribe, you can have like an extended family, you can have like a chosen family at work. You know, and I felt that with my, with uh, sis.com back then, like I'm still like this Saturday, we're going to go jam together. You know, the management team that, that we built together, the culture is so tight. We're like friends for life, you know? And then here with 500, like we have a lot of that too. But the difference with 500 is not all of us in the same office. We've got like 260 people in about 20 plus offices, right? So how do you build scalable intimacy with that? How do you build a home where people can be there for 10 years? I've been in this firm for 10 years, you know? Of course, like you can say, oh, of course, like, you're the owner of the firm. Of course, you're there for 10 years, right? Yeah. But the thing is like, I, 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 I have other people who've been working here for six years, eight years. And that's rare because they're young people, right? And you say they're all young people two years, then they jump already or whatever kind of accusation, right? So I'm thinking like, yo, can we have a career home? And what does that mean? How do we unpack that? So it's something I'm playing with, you know, and so I'm working with my team on, right? So love one person, love yourself, right? So that's the, the, on the home front. On the work front, to build like a career home. Um, third one is that the mainstreaming of venture capital is the acupuncture point, the acupuncture point for challenger nations to leapfrog. Is for us to actually be part of the middle power, for us to actually have like some sovereign, have more participation in the global economy. Because venture capital, my belief is that venture capital will back the trailblazers and the dreamers and the people who are going to build next big new economy companies. And if Malaysia or any country challenge a nation is to be defined by their IKS or their, their Volvos or whatnot from Sweden, you know, or like, you know, their, their big companies, I think that's got a big role to play. And so to the extent that it can be mainstream, once upon a time, banks in Malaysia used to invest in venture capital firms. So that's kind of why... It's like, a long time ago, actually. It's a long time yeah. ago, right? So what, why, why did they stop? Right? VCs have a lot to do with it because maybe the returns, you know, they have to like uphold certain returns. But if there's more capital participation in the act of venture capital and you turn it not from risk capital, but the skill of venture capital, it actually shifts into growth capital and it cannot lose money one. My vision is for venture capital to cannot lose money one, you know. If I can bring it to that bucket of like it's impossible to lose money, then we've won. Right now, venture capital still has that risk associated. That, well, that it's venture, right? Yeah, yeah. There's this idea of venture. Yeah. But of course, like 500, we invest in 100 companies for our seed funds, right? Yeah. So you can have like 80 companies. Like one company like Castle makes back almost 2x two, two the whole fund already, right? So 99 of them can fail, but one needs to win, right? So we're trying to play with different ways. And I won't go into the finance of it because we do want to wrap up. The Like there is a goal. There, there, there's a lot of gymnastics in finance that we can uh, put, put together and innovate so that venture capital is no longer risky. We're just de-risking it. Public markets have had many years of different mechanisms so they can de-risk a lot of, at least not absolutely, but de-risk a lot of it. Venture has to do that work and I'm ready to do that work with them, right? With this industry. So, and the more we mainstream venture, more dollars get poured into innovation and then a lot of our issues of the future, at least we have allies of the future versus enemies of the future, right? So that's one. Lastly, is that um, on the, what's in store for the future next many years, I think a global, I think a global collaborative awareness is arising. For a very big part, 10, 20 years, I think globalization has like encouraged a lot of collaboration, but a lot of countries also like, oh, you know, like they're trying to like take care of things on the home front. Mm -hmm. But um, as countries and leaders start collaborating, exchanging ideas and different industries start working together to build new projects, to build new things. Like at 500, I remember I was describing my work to someone who's a early Alibaba employee once. Uh, he told me, he said, dude, 
you guys are building the one belt, one road of the new economy. <laughs> Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like, okay, well, I didn't see it that way. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> okay, you know, he's like, you know, he's like China focused. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, you're, you're kind of right, right? He's like entrepreneurs they collaborate with one another. Our investors are from all around the world. Then we invest in all these countries, and then we we've done a lot of bridging Middle East, Malaysia, you know, and and and, and so and US, Malaysia, and so so forth, and other countries. So it's like, oh yeah, it's true. But it's a responsibility as well. Right, we work with governments of like Kazakhstan, you know, like the, the country of Georgia, you know, second cities like Osaka, so and so forth, right? To kind of connect the entrepreneurial ecosystems via venture education, not just venture capital. We actually, and not many people know this, but 2015 we built a, a school of venture capital of Stanford. It's called uh, VCU, Venture Capital Unlocked. Half of it's taught by Stanford, half it's taught by us. We've graduated over a thousand people from VCU. Wow. Yeah. So wow. they go there for a two-week course, you know, and then there's thousand people, and they're from all around the world. Because again, we want to spread weapons of mass creation. So it's not just building entrepreneurs, right? I we, love that phrase, by the way. Yeah, so we, we, we're, we're actually uh, getting more VCs. Because if the VCs are skilled and they know how to work with the entrepreneurs and they can get earn the trust of asset allocators to put yeah. capital towards entrepreneurs and they can yeah. do it in Kazakhstan or do it somewhere else or do yeah. it in Malaysia, yeah. then this whole future, again, we can steer towards the brighter future, right? Yeah. I think I'm going to need about a month to process everything that he said. <laughs> <laughs> and I think... And I'm, I'm well, I, well I'm going to need a lifetime to process all of this, okay? So it's like, I, I have a lot of work to do too, so... And I think I've never said this before, but I think I think you're, you are the perfect guy to talk to on an annual basis. <laughs> no, seriously, because... There's so much, um, there's so much movement. There's, there's so much uh, kinetic energy in what you're saying, that I, I think people should should know, and I think people will benefit from. So, thank you, brother. Oh, well, I'll, I'll be glad to be back. I'll be back. I'll you be back. Glad to be back. Yeah, this yeah, is a great space you. for it. Thank okay. 